Planning, Zoning, and Building Committee to order. Uh, will the minute taker please call the roll? Alderman Lazara? Here. Alderman Jacob? Here. Alderman Winger? Alderman Catalano? Here. Alderman Mori Wesley? Alderman Woods? Here. Alderman Sismarski? Here. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Here. I declare a quorum. Uh, next is report and recommendation of Front Street Facade Renovation Program update. Mr. Miss Jennifer, Mr. Forrest. Mr. Which Forrest. One? Tag team. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as as uh, you're all aware, this, <clears throat> excuse me, the City Council budgeted $200,000 to get involved in a private uh, public partnership for facade renovation program on uh, some buildings on Front Street. Uh, we had gone through getting some bids from the contractors, plans had been prepared, we had an agreement with the owners, and uh, at the final step, which was proof of funding, uh, one of the two owners... Did we approve the minutes? We're going to go back. We're, oh, we're okay. go back. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. Continue. Thank you. Uh, we received correspondence from one of the property owners that, due to financial reasons, he was going to be withdrawing from the project. Uh, he has indicated that he does have a long-range plan for his two buildings. Uh, this, this particular owner is the gentleman that owns the State Farm Insurance Building and the liquor store. And his, his plan, uh, he, again, I've asked him, talked to him a couple of times. He says he expects in about three years he's going to actually take those buildings down and build new buildings. So he has a hard time right now justifying uh, investing not only his money but the city's money in a building that uh, has some issues with it and is uh, uh, basically there would just be aesthetic improvements. He wouldn't see a net return on it. At the same time, the owner of the two-story building um, is still very excited about being involved in the program. He hopes that the city will decide to continue with the facade improvement program. He recognizes that uh, going with this program, improving his business is going to provide him some positive net results. Once the improvements are completed, he anticipates the ability to attract some higher quality tenants and uh, has actually discussed the possibility of providing a drive through installation on the east side of his building um, and marketing the space to a Starbucks or a similar tenant that would uh, use a drive through as part of its lease. Uh, he's already in the process of securing bids for a revised scope of work. We will still be able to use all the plans that have been prepared thus far because these buildings are all separate standalone buildings. So uh, we would be able to use the same plans that we've already had drawn up, the structural engineering plans, all those would still be relevant uh, if we decide to go through with this. The $200,000 that the city has uh, dedicated to phase one is it was basically this was going to be bid as one project, including all three buildings. The owners were going to be responsible for hiring the general contractor, and we never really had an allocation of funding per building. It was just for the overall project in general. So we will have to see what kind of bids Mr. Rivera comes up with, and then at that point, if we need to decide uh, if there's going to be an adjustment to the funding, we would do it at that point. This is probably the first setback we've had on the facade program. Would not expect it to be the last uh, one, but hopefully they will be few. And we just, ha I think, have to keep in mind that this is a long-range program to provide the town center and get some improvements to some of our existing buildings. So with that, uh, our recommendation would be to proceed forward with the program, basically at this point targeting the two-story building, 153 to 159 Front Street and then also consider some other properties for inclusion so that we can continue forward with this. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Lazara, you had a question? Yes, I did. Um, actually, two part, if I may. Thanks. John, you, um, you said we had a $200,000 budget. How much have we spent uh, on that so far? In architectural costs, structural engineer, uh, surveys, we've spent uh, a little under $14,000. And how much do you think we spent on the um, building that uh, pulled out? Half of that? 
I suppose just for the sake of conversation, we could say half yeah. of that. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry if I may again. Sure. Go ahead, Frank. I guess, John, what, what I'm kind of getting at is I know we've been doing this for, what, almost two years, the facade program. Um, and now all of a sudden this guy says, well, I was always going to tear these building down. I mean, is there a way that we can get a better commitment off of these uh, owners, or are we, you know, my wishful thinking? Well, my thought would be if, if the council decides they want to go forward with this program, we would uh, have a sit down with Mr. Rivera and the city attorney and staff and perhaps even the chairman of this committee and really hammer out uh, a more concrete agreement. Yes. Mr. Bond. Yeah. And part of it is, I know there's frustration, and, and I worked hand-in-hand uh, -hand with, uh, with John on this. You know, you have to do the due diligence on both sides. The city has to make sure that these, the structures can handle the facade that is being contemplated, and the property owners have to, after that determination is made, then they have to go, you know, look at their financing. This is sort of news to us that they're going, <laughs> there's a decision to tear that down. I know it had always been, you know, find out if the buildings can uh, accommodate this. Initially, they were both, it was sort of a, a dual project. They were in it together, so we were waiting on one for the other. We actually had a unified agreement uh, for that uh, purpose. So it would be nice to, to get them to commit up front, but it's one of those things where they don't know what they're committing to until we expend the money, get the architectural, and get that work done so that we can demonstrate to them, yes, in fact, this is a viable project from your standpoint. Now do you want to commit to do it? So I think, unfortunately, regardless of how we refine it, there's always going to be an expenditure of money in, on the city's ledger, if you will, uh, to be able to demonstrate to the property owner that this is a this is worthwhile and again it's a cost sharing uh, uh, program so you know we're we're initiating that uh, so it, it would be nice not to have that or have some way to recoup that uh, money and unfortunately it, it's just that's not not a viable way of doing it and, and we've done this in other communities I've represented and and we've had pretty good success but every once in a while a property owner for whatever reason changing ownership or you know one of the the principals dies or something and they have to back out you know after you've already started the process so you know unfortunately that's uh, that's the the risk we run with, you know trying to provide a program like this all of Eugene Wesley so so he said he's going to tear those buildings down in, in three years, maybe, or whatever. Here, here's my concern about this. We already did all the lake work for him. He's got a, a copy of the design, am I correct? Does he have a copy of everything? Uh, I don't think he has a copy of the plans. That's kind of one of the other sidebars to this conversation. I think we mentioned we did get three bids from contractors for the overall scope of work. Those bids came in at 670,000, 437,000, and 430,000. Now the $430,000 contractor uh, adjusted his price down to 400,000 and since basically the onus of hiring the contractor was going to be put on the property owners, um, there's also, <laughs> this contractor has apparently been found to be less than above board totally. Uh, but the bottom line, to answer your, I'm sorry, to answer your question, he may, I'm not sure if he has a copy of the plans, but copy of the plans, it's only for a facade renovation of the front of the building. It's not a building plan to build a new building or anything okay. like that. Okay, let me do a follow-up on it. One more. But he has the, the facade. So we already did his, we did part of his building actually for him, except for the walls and everything else. We pretty much designed the front of his building with $200,000. The only thing that was really presented to him was a concept of what, how the city wants these buildings to look. Again, the actual physical plan that he has shows a, a remodeling of the building that's there now. It's not anything to, to could, I mean, he may incorporate elements of that design. In fact, I would hope that he would. I would hope that by the time he tears those buildings down, the city may have some sort of an architectural committee, particularly for the downtown area, where we can have a bit of control over uh, the aesthetics of something that's built. But as far as him trying to build a building using the plans that he may have, not going to happen. Peter, Alderman Jacob. 
Um, the fact that we've been working on this for almost two years, I, I'd like to make the motion to move forward with the program, including the two-story building and other properties to be considered for inclusion in the Second. future. Second. Alderman Roy Wesley. Um, I've been talking finance, 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 financial, financials, and that's probably what happened here. So I'm not too happy about it, but uh, Mr. City Manager, has, have you been talking to any other businesses that might be in line to go forward with this? Mr. Mermis. Yeah, I think there's a couple businesses that are excited and are already aware of the program, and they'd probably be willing to, to jump on board at an accelerated pace, um, and we can bring that information back to you. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, go ahead and pursue that and go on to the next one, but let's do a little different for financials, too. Go Alderman ahead, you want to tell me due diligence, right? Alderman Lazara, do you still have a... No, Pat Bond one. No, it's been answered. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bond? Yeah, it does become a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation where they're not going to give us our financials until we demonstrate that it can be done. So you're not, you're, you're, it's unlikely a property owner is going to participate and turn over their, their information, their financial information on a project that may never come to fruition. So they want us to do, that's why we do the due diligence. I understand that, but Mr. Bond, you... Alderman Roy Wesley. Sorry. I figured I'd take your meeting over. Good. <laughs> we know that you being an attorney of $400,000 home that you could afford. Me is another sta standard. We know how businesses are in Wooddale, basically. So we could feel that out without doing the due diligence. We still are doing our due diligence that way, though. Mr. Bond. Well, I don't know that you can. I mean, using your example, maybe I have all kinds of debt. And so, you know what I mean? <laughs> but no, but in, 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 in seriousness, the, but without knowing, and I think what's more important is not who has the money, but where is that going to, where is that facade improvement going to best serve the, the city? And I think this was one that was targeted because it is a, a, an entry point to the city. It's, it's an area that, you know, is not as attractive as it, it might otherwise be. So the city is sort of dictating which properties are going to participate in the facade improvement. And to Alderman E. Wesley's uh, comment, the city is also dictating the design of what it's going to look like. We're not giving them plans, so they can't just take and go ahead and build their own. Although, as John said, I think if they did, we'd be great. Let them build it on their dime. We were willing to cost share with them to build it. So, um, so to that extent, you know, it really is a city, sort of a city-driven project. And the, the, the impetus is it's going to spur, you know, economic development by making the properties look, look better and more inviting and making, you know, there's some advantage to the city. I just want to make a, a statement to the, to the money point. I don't think it was a matter of whether he could come up with the money. It came down to uh, when, he, when he looked at the investment, he, he didn't get the, quite the return that he wanted to get versus his long-term plan of tearing that building down. Now, in fact, he will benefit probably, and that plan works better because we will remodel the other building, improving the values. But again, that still achieves the objectives that we set out to achieve, I would think. Uh, Alderman Eugene Wesley, did you have another I question? I just have one other question. Are we spending, there's no more commitment to any more money for this project at all, am I correct? Or, or are we still, the 200000 is still, that we budget for for this project, there ain't no more expenditure coming forward that you're going to come in back here and ask for another 100000 for this project. I, no, I, not that I'm aware of. It's obviously not even staff's decision to even consider, but right. no. We're, we're still working on the same 200000 that we approved and trying to get that done. I, Correct. I have no problem with forward this. I just don't want to come back and say, okay, this guy's going forward, but now we need more money to Right. Build. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. all I want to know. Okay. Any other questions? Can we get a roll call vote on this? Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. 
That motion passes. Uh, next, I'd like to approve the minutes of the meeting, May 8th, 2014. That's my motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. Motion carries. Next is report and uh, recommendation award City Hall roof overlay project to CSR Roofing Contractors, Inc. in the not to exceed amount of $104,014. Who's Jeremy? Yes, good evening, and thank you, Chairman Woods. Uh, what's in front of you tonight is a recommendation to award uh, the City Hall roof overlay project to the lowest responsive bidder. Uh, that was a CSR Roofing Contractors, Inc. Uh, the project entails uh, adding a second uh, new layer to the existing roof, uh, replacement of all flashing, uh, aluminum reflective coating, and a matching gravel stop. And I've also included a 10-year warranty for both labor and materials. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alderman Jacob. One question I had, um, I see it says a 10-year warranty. Um, I'm the president of my condo association, and we're also looking at roofs, and every roofer we've had has been giving a 15-year warranty. And we have a commercial building as well, so I'm just wondering why they're only doing a 10-year warranty. Jeremy? Uh, yes, I, uh, I did consider that, and uh, the expected life is 15 to 20 years, uh, so 10 years seem to be pretty fitting uh, to cover the labor as well as the materials. Um, so that's pretty much the reasoning behind uh, the 10 year warranty. Alderman Jacob? Um, I guess if we did vote on this, Nick, um, could we go back and ask for a 15 year warranty? I mean, I preferably would like to see a 15 year warranty versus a 10. Jeremy? Uh, yes, I could uh, propose that to the contractor if, if the project is awarded to them, because uh, you know we're not under contract yet or anything. So I could ask them that question. They didn't bid under that uh, assumption, but I can definitely ask them. Sure. Okay. Alderman Lazar. Jeremy, at the very bottom of this uh, analysis, you have that the project will not exceed the budget amount of 150000 Are you asking us to approve that 150000 today, or you're just looking for the 104000 Jeremy? Uh, yeah, it's just the $104,014. So you'll come be to us again for maybe another forty, forty-five thousand 45000 to finish this project? Sure. Uh, well, it basically, it depends uh, what they find up there. Uh, from my discussions with uh, the manufacturer, they, given uh, our roof and, and its age, they, and the problems that we've had and the problems that we haven't had as far as we haven't had any really, really bad leaks or anything like that, um, they basically said that, yeah, that, that the insulation should be fine, but we want the contractor to do some test cuts here and there. Um, so that is kind of the X factor that we don't know at this point exactly. Uh, but you'd have to put down a, a lot of money up front to find that out ahead of time. Uh, so that's kind of the... Okay. The, one follow-up. All of them in Lazar. So this 10000 is that included in the 104, or is that above and beyond that? Jeremy? I uh, guess that's above and beyond that. Uh, that's the uh, $15 a square foot if they do replace any insulation. Okay. Um, and if it does, you know, the replacement of insulation... If that part goes over or approaches 10,000, we will come back to the council to, to get direction. Okay. Mayor, please. So in other words, Jeremy, you're saying that the motion should be not to exceed 114,000, not 104, because if they make a motion 104,000, I know the manager has rights up to $10,000, but. Elements of Smarsky. Jeremy, you have on here uh, the manufacturer stated they will not provide a 10 year warranty without doing that check. So you're saying that we have to put a significant amount of money up front for them to do that check, correct? The cutting of the. Jeremy. Uh, the, the test cutting is, is just something they do as they go, and, and there's no fees or anything involved with that. It's just a matter of the manufacturer being sure that we don't put a new layer over an already wet layer underneath. Um, so they're basically just going to test that as they go, and about I think it's every 20 feet they have to test.
test the insulation underneath, and if, if they do find wet insulation, they'll come to us first and, and tell us, and we'll be able to see it and verify it and that sort of thing. So. Jeremy, let me ask you a question. On the, the warranty, what was the original warranty from the uh, contractor, from the applicators? Was there a warranty at all, or were just, are, and are we paying, and if so, how much are we paying for the 10-year manufacturer's warranty? Um, yes, that is uh, included in the 104000 But what portion, do you know what portion was the warranty? I do not. Okay. And, and there was no other warranty by the contractor without buying the extra manufacturer's warranty. Is that correct? Uh, well, yes, generally the, I think the, main, the, the manufacturer's warranties are the you know, preferred route in, with the roof. Uh, with the roof project. Um, so we, we definitely want to stick with the manufacturer as far as the materials go, and then the, the contractor for the workmanship will also add the labor in as well. So. Right. Well, what I'm saying is the material itself is probably warranted for whatever, 20, 25 years, 30 years, whatever they give you. We're buying in that package an extended warranty backed by the manufacturer for the labor. What am I getting from the contractor? Is my question. Uh, the, the the guarantee of, of of the the labor. So the the any defect in the in the labor or the workmanship, they would you know within ten years they would have to come back and and replace it. So. But that's being backed by the manufacturer. You're saying the manufacturer is going to pay if there's a failure. I'm assuming they pay the labor to the contractor. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how they obtain the warranty exactly. Uh, I just know that it's included as, was part of, it was part of the bid specifications that they provide that. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how they okay. go about uh, securing the warranty. But. All right, thank you. Alderman Jacob. Not to sound like a broken record, and from a legal standpoint of view, um, what would we need to do to get a 15-year warranty, which is what's standard in the industry? Mr. Bond. You would uh, approve this uh, with the condition that you, you, you would approve the awarding of the contract uh, to this uh, CSR roofing, uh, and as part of that motion, include the authorization to uh, Jeremy to negotiate a warranty of 15 years. Okay. So you, you have the right under the statute to, uh, once you've selected the lowest responsive bidder, responsible bidder, you have the right to negotiate with that bidder at that point, and so you're adding an additional term. Uh, I just want to make a statement before you, uh, I call you again. My, my only concern, that's okay that we get the better warranty. I, I don't know that 15 years specifically is industry standard, but uh, we may run into what their requirements are. What I do know of the warranties or guarantees that the manufacturer backs, the more you ask for, the more they ask for. So if you want 15 years or 20 years, they could give you 30, but they might say tear off the building, use tapered insulation, three-ply this system, which might add another fifty, hundred thousand dollars of cost to it. So I'm okay with looking into it, but let's not get hung up. We don't want to double the price of the building. If it was two grand more for five years than I'm in, if they you know want to make it more than that, uh, I'm not really interested. That being said, Alderman Jacob. I, I'm with you on that. I don't want this to become another 50000 but if it's a couple thousand, I'd like to make the motion that Pat said uh, to approve CSR. So that's your motion to yeah. approve? Yeah. To, um, to approve the 114000 plus the ability to negotiate to, yes. the 15 years. Do we Cor want a correct. dollar amount on that? <coughs> Okay. Uh, Mayor, please. Jeremy, you really didn't say, do we need to make the motion 114000 or, or just? Mr. Mermis. I guess it's your preference in a way. We thought that we just approved the bid amount of 104 because it could be zero added on to that, and then it right. could be 1000 or two, and I can just handle and not bug you with it. Or if you want to go just ahead, and it really doesn't matter. You it's had to do it, right. kind of your guy's decision. <clears throat> Mr. Forrest. I would like to make one recommendation on this too, Alderman Woods. You made a very good point. I mean, typically the manufacturer's warranty on the material is typically a 20-year warranty. I think the, what I would like to have uh, specified in this contract 
uh, is the, la the warranty on the labor and installation. The product, the membrane, we know that's going to probably have a 20-year warranty, but how long will they warranty the labor and installation, which a lot of times in the construction business is only a year, as you know. Right, a year so, or five years in, right. in some cases, but uh, Jeremy. I, I just also wanted to add that uh, for next week's packet, uh, it, it will, the, the contract will be in there as well as the warranties. I'll, I'll get all that together. Um, and in the packet for you to view next week uh, before this is uh, approved formally at council. So. Okay. Uh, Alderman Eugene Wesley. Two questions. Is this coming out? 2014-2015 budget or is this from last year's budget? Don't we care to answer that? Jeremy. Uh, yes, in the current fiscal year we have $150,000 budgeted for this project. For 1415. Okay. May I do one follow up? Alderman Eugene Wesley. My concern right now is, is, is here, here's the concern I, the packet's coming out tomorrow with everything. I think there's a lot of questions that were raised here that needs to be addressed in this contract. I don't think it should be, my, my motion will be to table it back to committee until we get because I know they're going to be on a rush to get this done because they won't be here Monday. You know, so I think the holidays here, I just don't want this ran through that legally. There's too many questions on this contract right now. So I'm going to make a motion, table it back to committee. We already have a motion and a second. Table of rights, right? If you got a second. <clears throat> if you got a second. Table of rights, only a second. Mr. Mermis. We are all in luck because next week there is no council meeting being the fifth Thursday of the month. So you have two weeks to get the information ready. So you can rest assured that you will have enough time. Do you still on the table? No, but I'd like to know who was the other contractors that, did, that you sent proposals out to. I, I would like to know the, that list too and, and why they were disqualified I'm sure there were good reasons I just as a general rule so, like yeah, to know that I do follow so we have a okay one last question. Here, here's the question we have addressed it. this concerns before when when we went out for bids that we would like all the who who was given the packets and everything else and who didn't come in with bids this ain't the first time this has happened that I only get the two we asked that, and we had this discussion at the city council level before, that we wanted everyone that went out for bid, if they replied or not, we just want to know who they went out to. Okay. And it seems like this is not happening. We had this discussion before. So, Mr. City Manager, could we see that it gets back on the agenda? We did it for a little while, and then we, we lost it. Because I'd like to know who else got the proposal. Mr. Mermis. Yeah, I, I apologize. Um, I guess I'm confused. I thought you wanted the responsive bidders. I didn't know you wanted every single person, even if it was disqualified. Yeah. I didn't know that was relevant. But if you guys want that, we'll give them all to you. No yeah. problem. It would be nice just to, to see and then start to understand why people were left out and why we're choosing the people that we're choosing. Uh, Alderman Eugene Wesley, would you like to withdraw your motion to table? I'll withdraw the motion. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next is reporting. Mr. Mermis. Was the motion with the one, the 114 or the 104? The 104. Okay. Am I, that's correct? Uh, next is report and recommendation case number 14-SU4, special use for personal wireless facility at 190 South Wooddale Road. Ms. Hennigan. Uh, thank you. <coughs> at this month's Community Development Commission meeting, the commission made a motion to recommend approval of a special use for personal wireless facility on top of the Brookwood Condominiums building. These, this would be an installation for AT&T wireless facilities on top of the tall multi-story building there. I believe it's uh, 11 stories. They have provided a lot of information that was in your packets about the service gaps that there and that are currently existing, how this would address those, and 
also the stealth design that would be incorporated. Uh, we do have the petitioner and a representative of the Homeowners Association here tonight if there are any additional questions. Um, I guess I'll keep the discussion short at that and see if there's anything you have for me. Okay. Uh, Alderman Eugene Wesley. I, how, how heavy is this, this, this antenna? Uh, how heavy is yeah. it? Uh, that could I, a roof hold it, thing? That I, I would ask the petitioner to address, okay. if possible. You gotta go up could to you, the mic. Could you step to the, the microphone and give there. us your name and the, the company nope. so that no, right you could sit. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Andy Fitz, and uh, I'm here representing AT&T um, for this petition. Um, in response to your question about the weight, um, uh, we've employed uh, an architectural and engineering firm um, that will um, conduct a structural analysis uh, on the roof. Um, where the they've already done a, done a mapping of the roof, where they go out and walk it, uh, where they have the um, the antennas proposed, they've determined that that uh, area uh, can handle the loads. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly if, uh, we have to have a passing structural, and that's something that AT&T requires internally. Okay. I just didn't see that in our report. Okay. Alderman Mike Sismarski. Do we have any illustrations of what it would look like? About yes, that? yeah. If you'd like, I could run through my PowerPoint presentation real quickly, or at least I can jump to the photo since. Yeah, could you, and then there. maybe that'll eliminate some of the questions. Sure. I can have a slide. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, this is just a nice aerial view. So, this is just an aerial photograph, obviously, of the Brookwood on the Greens condominiums building. Uh, this is the existing roof, the condensing units, various events uh, on the top. Uh, this is the actual um, uh, uh, lease exhibit showing uh, the three uh, areas where the uh, antennas would be located. Um, there are four antennas per sector. Um, this is a uh, elevation, building elevation showing um, roughly uh, where they would be located on the roof as well. Um, this is a, uh, the, uh, one of the reasons AT&T uh, is proposing a telecommunications facility in this location is because they currently have a gap uh, in coverage in their network and they're seeking to improve that and to improve the telecommunications uh, network uh, in this area of Wooddale. So this is the, uh, what's called a propagation map and this is before uh, the sites there. Um, the white and the, the white areas uh, sort of in the middle and on the edges would be an area that uh, has very low or no coverage. Um, and if you'll go to the next slide, this is with the addition of the antennas. So it greatly improves their coverage and uh, makes their network more cohesive. Uh, this was the photo simulation that was done. Uh, there were four pictures that were taken. This is the before uh, shot from the uh, looking south. And uh, this would be after. Um, so I've, I've actually I've got some stealthing material I'm going to pass around. But uh, the antennas will be entirely concealed. And um, the company that we'll be working with uh, will match um, the color um, to, to look exactly like the building. It's a, uh, it's a fiberglass and foam composite material. It's a fiberglass and foam composite um, that can be uh, constructed to match almost any surface. Uh, so basically, um, Jennifer, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, this is the before um, shot looking northwest. Um, there's the uh, after with the addition of the um, stealthing enclosure. Um, so it'll basically, right now you've got one um, elevator penthouse. Um, these will all be below that in height, but it will basically look like there's an additional uh, three penthouse structures on the roof. Uh, here's another shot looking north. Um, there you can see the, uh, the antennas actually aren't visible because of the existing um, structures on the roof. And here's another shot looking east. And there's the addition. Um, I believe that completes the photo simulation. 
Here's an example um, of, this is not, this is from another site, but basically in this case they had to match the brick of the existing building. Um, so this would be an enclosure. Um, so from the, uh, uh, from the surrounding area, um, the antennas will be completely concealed and they'll, uh, and they'll, they'll match nearly perfectly with uh, the color and the uh, materials that, that the building is constructed out of. Alderman Roy Wesley. I, other companies will be able to attach to this? Uh, no, no, this is, uh, this, this would just be AT&T. This would not be, a, uh, unlike a monopole, uh, this would not be a, a co-location opportunity. Uh, whether or not other carriers uh, propose to uh, approach Mr. Guinea um, and uh, want to also place their antennas here would be another matter. Um, so, but, but the the, um, the structure um, of either the uh, when you know we're talking about a monopole. If we want to allow co-location, we have to make sure that the structure can support the additional carrier antennas. Um, in this case. Um, AT&T is obviously just looking at um, its own antennas. Whether the roof can support additional antennas, uh, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Alderman uh, Lazaro. Is the uh, representative of the Homeowners Association here? Yes, sir. Yeah, can I just ask? Um, I, okay. Yeah, could you go to the microphone sure. and give us your name and address? My name is Dan Guiney. I'm the president of the board for Brookwood on the Green. Uh, basically, Dan, what's in it for the homeowners? Money. Okay. <laughs> there, there's the bottom line, right? Unless, okay. unless you're an AT&T customer and you live in the building, then you'd have to step outside to improve your service. Yeah. But right now, it, uh, the income from this project should probably maintain our assessment level for the next 10 years. Uh, AT&T is looking for a 25-year agreement with us in five-year increments. Uh, we've uh, negotiated part of that price. It's, uh, you can always ask for more, I guess. But there's also an escalator involved. And uh, financially, it's uh, very much worthwhile for the building. OK, thanks. Alderman Roy Wesley. I make a motion to <coughs> approve. Second. Alderman Mike Sismarski. I guess mine would be a two-part question, one for you and one for the other, General Minister Phipps. Uh, this isn't blo a blocking technique or anything? This isn't going to mess anybody else's reception up? Any other carriers? Uh, no. No, it would not interfere okay. with any other carrier. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the other question would be, would is the homeowners association open to other contractors putting stuff up there, or is this just a? We had an inquiry from uh, Verizon, okay, um, and never heard from them again. That was about three months ago. Okay. We do anticipate hearing from people, but you know. I just didn't want to. I just wanted to know if it was like a monopoly of one one no. block, and that was it. Okay, thank you. And uh, Alderman uh, Catalano. The structure, is it pretty much secure the way it's, um, once it's put down in the building? Uh, yes, yes, it can, uh, um, once it's constructed, it'll withstand hurricane force winds, basically 90, 100 miles an hour. Okay. that shows it from the back. It's really not a huge piece of equipment. Um, and but that was my question to, to them earlier today, will it withstand? And yes, it's been proven that uh, it'll sustain. So, thank you. I, well, I have one question. Just, um, I just want to know if there's anybody in the audience that has opposition to Anybody that came to speak on, on this su subject before we? Okay, that's all I want to know. Uh, can I ask a question? You just mentioned there's no interference with other carriers. E excuse me? You, you have to oh. get up. If you could get up and go to the microphone and give us your name and everything. Thank you. Uh, 
Melissa Stoll, 145 South Cedar in Wooddale. So I'm a few blocks from the building. And uh, the representative from the company just had expressed that there was no interference to other carriers. I think you're talking telephone and whatnot. What about to radio and television reception? A broadcast antenna. Mr. Fitz. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, my answer would be that no, there would not be any interference. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's call the roll if there's no other questions. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next, Mr. Bond, do you want to handle this? We've got a yeah, the next uh, item in the uh, on the agenda. We did receive a communication from the uh, applicant uh, to the Honorable Mayor and City Council and the uh, Planning, Zoning, and Building Committee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has come to my attention that uh, some officials have relayed information that uh, if they were to grant a pawn shop variation, I would be selling guns in the neighborhood. I am truly saddened that the people I know would uh, spread such mistruths. I assure you that is neither true nor legal. I would have, however, been nice at any point, it would have been nice at any point in the process that anyone with questions would have called or stopped by the store and expressed their concerns or opinions for or against. Given the high level of controversy and the amount of misinformation out there, I've decided that this would not foster a good business relationship and does not, as you have shared fit it in your downtown vision plan. Uh, let me, my letter stand is my formal request to withdraw my application and request for a special use text amendment as described in case number 14 TA uh, SU5 for affordable thrift buy and sell LLC located at 423 East Irving Park Road. Sincerely, David H. Woods, owner affordable thrift buy and sell LLC. So with that being said, uh, the applicant has withdrawn uh, the request and application, so there is no need to go forward with that, those items. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bond. Next, then, would be report and recommendation case number 14 V6, 430 East Potter Street fence variation. Who's going to take that one? Ms. Hennigan? Um, did you want to do this one before the text amendments? Um, TA3? Oh, okay. Yeah, the, uh, let's go to the text <coughs> amendment first. I got ahead of myself. Thank you. Okay, um, this case is a series of text amendments um, following up from the adoption of the UDO in 2010. Since that time, a number of issues have come up over the past four years requiring some clarification uh, as people have applied for permits and staff has interpreted the rules. Uh, we just need a little more information as to what the intent of the council is in a number of areas. So we're not suggesting any changes in policy at all, but just really to clarify the council's intent and uh, making sure that the ordinance is achieving what you want it to achieve. There is a lot of information here that was provided in your packets, um, but we've got six proposed text amendments. The first five pertaining to lot coverage, lot coverage specific to accessory structures, building types, permitted obstructions, and detached garage height. Those five were discussed at the March CDC meeting. Uh, at that meeting, we did only have four members in attendance, so uh, only two of those items got uh, recommendations or had a motion that was had enough for a quorum. That's pertaining to building tights and permitted obstructions, both of which passed. Uh, the warehouses in the C2 district item was discussed at the May CDC meeting. Uh, that motion failed 5-0. I'm not sure how much detail you'd like me to get into at this point because uh, I know it, it is a lot of information on a lot right. of different subjects. So perhaps uh, I'll just... Uh, well, I have, a, I have a question on number six, the warehouse in C2. Uh, the motion failed. Are we saying that we're allowing warehouses in C2 or we're not allowing? Just so I'm clear. Um, that's, that's correct. It's to, excuse me, the, the motion is to continue to allow warehouses as special uses in the C2 district. So no change to the current ordinance. 
and was that done at the same that was done at the same meeting with the with the other motions correct um, no that one was done at this month's meeting the other five were back in March Any questions? Alderman Jacob? I, I guess what are we going to be voting on here tonight with this whole thing? Um, I don't know. What do you, we're probably best if we take them one at a time. You know, we don't have to have a lot of question on it, but at least we'll know which item we're, we're voting on and, and, and could ask a question individually on each one of them. <coughs> so, um, do we start with uh, number one, lot coverage general? Do you want to give like a brief reader's digest version, if you will? And uh, sure, sure. Uh, yes, and thank you. Taking them individually will be much easier. Um, the UDO res uh, regulates how you're able to build on a lot in two ways. You have setbacks that determine where you can place buildings on a lot and bulk limitations that determine how much you can build. Uh, it's floor area ratio, building coverage, lot coverage, height, and the number of stories all are bulk limitations. When the UDO was passed in 2010, we added building coverage as a new type of regulation that was not in the previous ordinance. It's the same thing as lot coverage, but it also includes paving such as driveways, sidewalks, and patios. Um, in reviewing permits over the last several years, staff has found that having three separate limitations on the amount of square footage can be unnecessarily confusing to builders and homeowners. Um, in looking how things were written, it seems as though the floor area ratio was possibly intended to be replaced by this new building coverage that was added to the UDO. And there's, uh, the floor area ratio was not even defined in the ordinance, so it seems that this may have been an oversight. Uh, we do know that the height of a structure is already limited by the number of stories and maximum number of feet. The area is limited by building coverage. So uh, the floor area ratio is, seems to be a bit superfluous and unnecessarily confusing. Right. It, it's kind of what you're saying. It's redundant. It's already covered yes. with the other one and, and really is in there verbally, but no definition of how it's applied or where it's applied. So uh, to clean things up, we're just eliminating that. Am I correct with that statement? Yes. Thank okay. you. You make a motion to approve this one. If you're doing every one of them. To approve eliminating the lot coverage from the UDO or eliminate the floor area ratio calculation, right? So would that be the correct? Yeah, the floor area ratio calculation okay. is what we're looking for. To eliminate. Correct. That. Okay. You made the motion. I'll second it. Uh, Mayor of Police. So if I understand correctly, we're still at 35% lot coverage, total driveways, mm -hmm. structure, everything. Just You're just taking out this ratio. Correct. The percentages aren't going to change at all. Okay. Just making sure. Any other, any other questions? Alderman Lazaro. Did the uh, committee not understand what they were approving here? Is that why they, is that why it failed? Um, I can't really. I, I, I was at the meeting. Yeah. I, I can only guess that there was, it wasn't as clear to everybody. That That's my guess. It, it's a fairly simple thing. As, as the mayor asked, the big concern is about lot coverage and really this does not go to either increasing or reducing the amount of lot coverage. Right, I see that, but I, well, I'm sorry. Um, Alderman Lazar. Well, I'm just kind of curious as to why it failed then. Specifically, I couldn't, I can't begin to understand. Okay. That, you know, that was my guess. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number two, lot coverage uh, and accessory structures. Ms. Hennigan. Uh, yes, this is a related issue. For single family homes in Wooddale, you're allowed to do 30% for your building coverage. That's just the principal structure and accessory structures, such as pools, sheds, decks, and that. 
um, and you're allowed 35% for lot coverage, which includes the paved areas. The discussion at CDC was if an additional lot coverage allowance should be allowed for accessory structures. Currently, this is allowed only in the R4 district. Um, really recognizing that you c it can be difficult to place certain types of structures and um, so they looked at that as well as if decks and above ground pools should be exempted from these regula regulations. Particularly on the, this became an issue because in many of the smaller lots in town it is difficult for people to accommodate an above ground pool with or without a deck and still be within that 35 percent restriction. No questions? <coughs> Alderman Lazar. Are we saying now we're going to go from 30 to 40 percent? Is that what we're asking? Or are we going, just make that clear. What, what are we asking? How, how, what Hennigan. percentage are we actually talking about now? Um, it would remain 30 percent for buildings, so the house itself would be kept where it is currently. You could just do an additional 10 percent for ex accessory structures. So if you built a house, maxed it out to 30 percent, right now you couldn't do anything, but the additional 10 percent would allow you to put a deck on top of that 30 percent. Alderman Lazar. How does that affect, you know, water drainage? I mean, that extra 10 percent. I know even if it's a pool, obviously a pool will capture the water. Um, but then we're talking about patios, cement patios and that. I mean, I think we have enough water problems. Ms. Hennig. Um, yeah, you're correct. Any type of accessory structure is obviously going to add to the impervious surface on a lot. We do have stormwater requirements that need to be followed for any type of construction in town, but that is part one of the reasons that we have bulk limitations to begin with is to limit the amount of development for stormwater as well as other reasons. Let me get one question in before you. Uh, what, maybe it'll help, what spurred this question? I mean, 50 people have come in and, and they're upset because they can't add a deck or a pool, or I mean, what, what's the intent? What are we trying to fix or solve or, here? Uh, that is essentially the issue. Uh, so people have come in wanting to put a pool or other structures on their property and have just been told they can't. So we're looking pool, shed, deck, and that's even using the pervious, non-pervious issues with pavers and, and decks. Do we count a, a deck as completely uh, impervious surface, or do we have a, a factor that we reduce it by being that it's got space decking? Um, basically, it is, we, there's no deduction allowed for that, because when you're looking at the, lot, the building coverage and lot coverage calculations. It's not a stormwater calculation, so it's not strictly pervious versus impervious. It's just a bulk, bulk. regulation. Alderman uh, Lazar. I would think maybe we can do an exception with uh, pools. Um, can we do that, uh, or do we have to have this blanketed? We, we can do whatever we want. We're the city council. Okay, because I mean, pools. <laughs> I mean, capture if you want to make a differentiation between pools or decks, or, I, or yeah, I would think that like there that, is. That's possible. Mayor, okay. please. Uh, regarding pools, I know uh, down the block from me, when we had a rainstorm uh, five, six years ago, heavy rain. The the owner of the pool didn't wasn't paying attention, and pool overflowed, flooded out his basement. Was very upset. So. I, you know, I don't know. I I think we should leave it alone. Mr. Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a little background on this. Uh, the zoning ordinance that was in effect prior to the adoption of the U UDO a few years ago, uh, they, the, their interpretation was an in-ground pool was considered as lot coverage because it was considered more of a permanent structure, but an above-ground pool was not considered as lot coverage. It was considered more of a temporary structure. Uh, also in the f old zoning ordinance, a deck was not considered as lot coverage. Because again, typically you construct a deck, uh, the planking is spaced, water is able to drip through the deck, and then percolate into the ground. 
Uh, when the UDO was, was put back together, it was decided at that time to include decks as lot coverage, which is where this issue now has created uh, you know, some problems with people wanting to put decks up. And then it also considers uh, you know, an above ground pool being considered lot coverage as well. So I think the old zoning ordinance looked at an above ground pool as more of a temporary structure. The UDO looks at it as being more of a permanent structure now. Alderman Roy Wesley. Um, this has come to us before about people wanting to build on, I think a couple years ago, John, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but and if, if I'm wrong here. And within the last year, how many people have come in and said they wanted to build a, a deck a patio, a pool, basically saying that they wouldn't be able to do it according to this new thing that you're proposing. I mean, I want, re uh, if you don't know real numbers, just tell me you don't ha have real numbers. I don't have real numbers right now. I can get them for you. We can check. <coughs> Alderman Smarski. Mr. Forrest, I'm not sure, but I know is asphalt or con versus concrete as a deck, does not not make for a permanent structure on the uh, lot coverage? Mr. Forrest. Asphalt is considered lot coverage, yes. Any sort of an impermeable surface, and in some cases, uh, we still consider permeable uh, structures as lot coverage. Alderman Jacob. Uh, I'm not sure if you could answer this, John, but if we do approve this, are we going to have more flooding problems, or do we have someone that could answer that question? If I could predict that, I would be a wealthy man. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that any large scale remodeling or any, uh, you know, significant increase in impermeable lot coverage requires an engineering plan be submitted uh, for review by the city engineer. Alderman Jacob. I guess my next question is when the, when it was uh, revised the codes, I mean, why did CDC have this? So now we have to revise that. I mean, there must have been a recommendation of some sort to keep it on, keep this stuff out of there. Do you remember why that was or anything? You're talking about when the UDO was, was adopted? Uh, I can't really say, to be honest with you. I mean, it was such a major step getting rid of the old zoning ordinance and going to this UDO. And it was, I mean, there was just so much material there. Uh, some of these issues haven't really appeared until this document's been in effect for a couple of years now and then as people have been wanting to do things and have been coming forward, we're kind of finding out what things need to be tweaked or uh, eliminated, that sort of thing. Ms. Hennigan. Uh, yeah, that's exactly why the question's before us tonight is that there were so many hundreds of issues considered at the time the UDO was adopted. These are the ones we wanted to make sure that there was a specific intent of the council to change the policy or if it was something that just slipped through the cracks. We just need to know. Okay, I have a question, maybe you can give it. Uh, in the R2 zoning district, how big are those lots, square footage, do, do, do you know, John, off the top of your, or Jennifer? 10,000 10, 10, 10, 10, square feet, so they're the bigger lots in town already. We're not taking a small lot and trying to cover the whole lot, just to put it, just to put it in perspective, so. Correct. I guess then what does that translate if we're going to add, I guess theoretically, what we came up with is would be increasing at 5%, right, from 35 to 40. Um, what does that add? Uh, what is that, 500 square 500. feet on a 10,000 square foot lot? Okay. Uh, Alderman Jacob. 
Maybe you could answer this, John. How, how many people, since we've had this, have we had to turn away because of the, the way it is currently? Are we talking five? Are we talking a hundred? Or uh, it's very similar question to Alderman Wesley's earlier one. I really don't have a figure for you right now. I can try and find out. Uh, I can talk to the staff that does the plan review and find out how many permits he's had to reject for that. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Um, I apologize, sir. Question for you. I don't see why we should even change this because if they really want to change, they could go in front of planning and zoning and ask for variance. Am I correct? Yes, that is correct. So I don't even know why we're discussing this. I would leave it as is and let them, them come to the petition and ask for variance and let the planning and zoning bring it back to us, yes or no. I mean, that's why we have that committee. So I, I would recommend it. Don't. Mayor, please. Uh, from what I recall, several years ago, the city took a turn on putting, automatically putting in sidewalks every time we did a full reconstruction on a road or whatnot. And what, what started happening is we started getting flooding in areas where we were never getting flooding. And I think when we were discussing this, we're talking about adding more coverage. That's why we kind of capped it off at this 35%. I vaguely remember that I was fairly new on the council, but um, you know, I mean, maybe the decking, like you said, the wood decking it has a slats that goes into the ground. Maybe we went a little too far on that one, but some of the other stuff, I think, I think that was because we've even backed off on automatically doing sidewalks. Royal Oaks was just done. There was no sidewalks put in. I mean, I, and I think that was part of the fear of why we stuck to the 35% pretty, pretty hard. Alderman Roy Wesley. John, the house sent over by Ethan Woods, those people had to go through a lot of hoops for the driveway. There's only one house there. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the lot coverage was on that house? I mean, would this fall under that? Off the top of my head, I don't remember what the square footage is, and I would have to check the plan file to see if they ultimately used permeable pavers or they, impermeable. They did, and it was supposed yeah. to be Concrete, checked out right. yeah. every year or whatever yeah. to come to the city. I mean, I was through the subdivision today, and the driveway appears to be in fine condition. <coughs> right. I make a motion to leave right where is whatever we have now. Of a motion to second, second uh, Alderman Jacob. I just want to make a statement today that this is just for the bigger lots in the community, just for a little uh, background. And we already have probably the most restrictive lot coverage of all the communities around us, barring none. Uh, so for adding a, a deck or a pool, which isn't temporary, uh, I would probably be more inclined to approve that, the 5% more uh, isn't going to make that huge a difference on a 10,000 square foot lot. Um, that's all I have to say. There's a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? One. Motion carries. Number three, building types. Ms. Hennigan? Ah uh, yes, this was one of the issues that the CDC did recommend passing. Um, it's the UDO has some lot development standards that identify different building types as well as the districts in which those types are permitted. Uh, however, some districts and building types cross multiple other districts and building types, and there's no guidance written in the UDO as to how these should be applied. Uh, this is create some confusion among developers and builders, others looking to interpret what they can build on a property. And so we're just uh, looking to add an explanatory statement to give guidance regarding which building typology should be followed in which zoning districts. Any questions? We have a motion. Second. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Motion carries. Number four, permitted obstructions. Ms. Hennigan. Thank you. This was, uh, I believe, another one that did pass the CDC with a favorable recommendation to add driveways and sidewalks to the list of permitted obstructions in the front side and rear yards. Uh, currently, they're not listed as permitted obstructions, so technically every driveway in town is in violation of the UDO. This is really just a cleanup issue. Right. Can I make a motion? Sure. We have a motion. We have a second. No questions. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number five, detached garage height. Uh, there was no motion or no recommendation. Do you want to give a little, maybe we can get this through here. I would be happy to. Uh, this item was discussed at length at the CDC meeting and a number of motions were proposed, but uh, none of them were able to get enough for a vote one way or the other. Um, by way of background, staffs noticed a continuing issue where the 15-foot height restriction at, measured at the highest point of the garage creates some significant design restrictions, forcing residents to go with sort of the stock design with a 412 pitch, um, really the most basic garage you can do. Uh, we have had a number of residents who've wanted to do something a little more architecturally interesting, uh, maybe to match the pitch of their home, and they've not been able to do that because of the 15-foot restriction. And speak with our, our inspector uh, and analyzing other communities, it appeared that going from 15 feet to 17 feet would not significantly change the visual impact of a garage when you're driving down the street. It's not going to look like a significantly larger structure, but would allow for some greater design flexibility and some different roof pitches. There were some pictures included in your packet, which uh, hopefully you'll be able to take a look at in case you're not familiar with roof pitch and the difference that it makes. We did also do a survey of other communities in the area, and most other jurisdictions do allow for more generous roof heights on garages than the city of Wooddale. So staff's recommendation was to allow detached garages up to 17 feet in height, but keep the 15 foot height restriction for any other type of accessory structure, such as a shed or a gazebo. This has no recommendations. That's correct. There is no recommendation. But it says staff has recommended. Is staff recommending or? I believe staff is recommending. Well, why isn't it on the thing? Why is it not on the thing? Uh, staff's yeah. recommendation was to the Community Development Commission. The Community Development Commission had no recommendation. So our recommendations don't go directly to PCB on these. Well, I mean, you do, Wesley. Or Roy Wesley, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, we've had problems with garages before in this city. Uh, and I could tell you one garage that looks like a warehouse because the height <coughs> went so high and stuff. And uh, I'd rather just leave this alone, too, and just leave where, where it is, and they could work around the uh, design on that. Let me before I, I I just want to jump in the the one you're talking about came before the board and they gave them a variance to build that whatever you want to call that structure not a garage this taking this to 17 foot on a standard 22 foot garage would only let you go up to like a 612 pitch which is more than standard on any building I mean you're not going to wind up with any super high structures. Uh, that you're concerned about. I'm concerned about the same thing. That one came to us at the vo at the variance level and was approved. That being said, uh, Mayor, please. And besides that one, there was another one that was built that I think was actually bigger than the house footprint and was tall, and I think that's why there was a, some of the neighbors were complaining about that one and uh, whatnot, and I think that's when we went to standard 15 foot and anybody who wanted something else and came before CDC because that that garage I think almost looks larger than the home mm -hmm. Mr. Forrest no the 15 foot high restriction on garages and accessory structures has been uh, part of our ordinances for at least the last 25 or 30 years 
It's always been a 15-foot high maximum <clears throat> for detached garages and or accessory structures. Mr. Jacob. By changing it to 17 feet, are there any issues with doing that? It sounds like that's what's standard in most other communities. Um, we did not feel there would be any additional issues. Uh, the two feet doesn't really add that much to the visual appearance of the, and it's not going to overwhelm a property or a neighbor, neighboring property. It shouldn't be too apparent, but it will still give people some more design flexibility. Alderman Jacob. With that in mind, I'd like to make a motion to change the height from 15 to 17 feet. Second. Mayor, please. Yeah, John, if, if we had 15 feet, that garage I'm talking about is well above 15 feet. That, it's got like an attic up there. I think he put in a bathroom or something else as well. Now, then it, it, was, it was in the, per the code, we couldn't stop that. And that's why I think we changed it. Again, that's, this is we're talking six, seven years ago. Yeah. Mr. Forrest. No, the, the 15 foot height restriction has been in for quite some time. Uh, for, I'd have to go back and look at the particulars on uh, the garage that I think you may be referencing. But that's one of the things that staff does when we go out and we do uh, do a framing inspection is uh, if, if we're questioning the height of the building, we'll actually physically measure it with a ruler from the highest point of the roof down to grade. So we have a motion and a second to approve going to 17 feet? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Two opposed. Motion carries. Three. Three. Let's let's take a roll call, please. Alderman Lazara. No. Alderman Jacob. Yes. Alderman Winger. Yes. Alderman Catalano. Yes. Alderman Murray Wesley. No. Alderman Woods. Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Yes. Alderman Sismarski. No. Motion carries. Uh, number six, warehouse in C2 district. Ms. Hennigan. Thank you. This was the uh, one item that was discussed at the May CDC meeting. Uh, at that meeting, the CDC recommended making no changes to continue to allow warehouses as a special use in the C2 district. Uh, this item came out of some discussion for a previous special use request for a warehouse uh, that was ultimately denied by the council and so we wanted to take the matter back up to make sure that uh, that was still the city's vision for the C2 district but again the CDC recommended no change warehouses could still be uh, special uses in the C2. I'll just make a statement I think that the other one was uh, turned down not so much because of the warehouse use but because of dividing up the building and it really wasn't a legal space so to speak you know so it wasn't uh, if, if they were using the whole building and it was going to be warehousing I think it probably would have been more acceptable so I'd be inclined to keep it any other questions Eugene Wesley um. For the most part, it is the east section of Irving Park Road uh, from central to the city limits, as well as Georgetown Center and the area over by Target and Jewel. There's also a small note of it right the properties immediately abutting Wooddale Road and Thorndale. Alderman Jacob. In that area of the C2, how many people, do we know how many businesses could actually come and ask for a special use for a warehouse? Uh, there are 44 different parcels that all could potentially ask for it. Okay. 
Any other questions? So, do we have a do we have a question, Mr. Leslie? Uh huh. Um, there's 24 unit, 24 possible places. 44. 44. 44. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a motion? No negative or no? I guess I make a motion to remove um, the warehouse from the special use of the CP district. Do we have a second? Motion fails. I'll make a motion to leave the warehouse as a, an approved special use. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. <coughs> I think that that's, uh, that's it. Uh, next uh, items to be considered. Oh no, report and uh, recommendation case number 14 V6 430 East Potter Street fence variation. Ms. Hennigan. Thank you very much. Um, the CDC recommended approval of a variation to allow construction of a six foot fence for the house at 430 Potter Street. This would be on the west side of the property going between the garage and the property line. Uh, they also, and the east side along Pine Lane they made their recommendation conditioned upon the petitioner working with staff to preserve a site triangle along the southern property line where so to <coughs> prevent any future conflicts with developments on that neighboring lots. Uh, that was the CDC's motion. We did attach in your packets um, information with the plan showing where the fence would be located and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Alderman Eugene Wilson. <coughs> Here's why I'm, uh, I'm not, unless someone can really sell this to me here, but I don't think it's going to happen. If you look at this, this fence, correct me if I'm wrong, we got 25, 20 feet of easement in front of that property on, on the street, am I right? Uh, you're referring to the area between the property line and the curb? Right. Yeah, there's about 20 feet. All right, so the way the fence is coming that I can see here, if we remove those trees that are there, that fence is sitting almost right on the street. That, that fence is gonna be right almost on that street. So that would be my recommendation. And in the memo here, you said in the rear yard, I guess there's a lot available back there that someone could build on? The property's to the south, yes. Okay, so that will impeach on that whoever buys that piece of property because that fence will be almost on their property. Correct, Miss Hennigan. Um, yes, it would be uh, would be visible from the front of that property. The CDC did take that into recommendation in part by notching out the fence for that ten foot site triangle, but part of it would still be visible. Okay, so I, I will tell you right now, my question, my vote would be no because now I'm starting to put fences right almost at the fence street now and, and there's no way I would like that thank you mr. Forrest I just want to clarify one thing just to be sure that uh, you know again so Alderman Wesley understands this right now the existing paved Pine Street with the curbs uh, it does not take up the entire right-of-way we have a 66 foot wide right-of-way so as you, as you look at this site plan, the existing <coughs> pine lane and the concrete curbs that were just installed by the developer is about, I would guesstimate it, 16 to 18 feet from the edge of the right-of-way. So this fence, if it's approved, is going to be 16 to 18 feet back from the existing curb. Now, if the city ever decides to widen pine lane into two lanes at some point in time, at that point, this could be an issue. But again, Pine is a new street that was just put in. Uh, so you are looking at a separation distance of, you know, 16, 18 feet roughly. 
and that would be to the fence line. And then as the uh, applicant has revised it, he's going to cut that corner to uh, clear that vision if they would build a house on the south for somebody coming, if they put the driveway there and they're coming down, uh, it would clear that vision triangle for them. It's just a point of clarification, not necessarily supporting or not supporting it. Alderman Mike Smarsky. Is that a big motion to pass the variance to pass Second. the variation? Any other questions? Alderman Eugene Wesley. So now what I'm hearing is that the petitioner agrees to make that change on that fence if he, they need to on that parcel. Is that what I'm hearing now? Um, yes, after the, after the CDC meeting, uh, we went out there and met with the petitioner, measured out that site triangle, that 10-foot site triangle, and he agreed to it, so we revised the plans accordingly. Okay. I have one follow-up question. So do we have that in writing that this petitioner agreed to this? I mean, because with this ain't in our packet saying that you guys had a conversation with him or an email sent to us saying we had a conversation they agreed to do that you know what I, I've been down this route before that we approved something and then there was agreement reached with the building department or something and then they had went back to the same same plan I mean do we have that in writing Miss Hennigan um, we, we did include that at, at the end of the memo that we met, had met with the petitioner and we attached the revised plan so that's part of what's being requested tonight and that would also be a condition of approval that would be spelled out in the ordinance that would be passed at the council level. Can, uh, I have a question on the, where's the front door on the residence? Is it closer to where that, you see the concrete towards Pine Street or is it closer by the garage? Uh, it is on the, the northeast side facing okay. Potter Street. And I, I, I know that the, the property owners got challenges with that corner lot having a lot, uh, any usable yard, and it's pretty elongated home. Uh, the only issue I see is, is that corner. I mean, if, if that corner could actually be the one by uh, Pine brought back to where the 25 foot setback line is back to the corner of the building as opposed to the part that juts out I think that's another five feet Miss Hennigan uh, the petitioner is here this evening and so uh, you would have the opportunity to ask if he's amenable to any changes would you could you go up to the microphone and then give us your name Evening. My name is Stamos Mamos at 4:30 East Potter. Be happy to take any of your questions. Mr. Mamos, on, on the Pine Street, you, do you, you understand what I'm saying? If we pulled that fence back, I don't know if it looks like five feet to the, that next corner, would that be acceptable? That would kind of clean up the sight line and actually the front, the whole front of the house, as I see it. Correct. Yes. Would would that be something that you're open to? I'm always open to anything. Of course, um, we did uh, go out and look at the sight line, and it didn't seem as it would be bothersome based on the angle of the street. But if it's something that has to be revisited, yeah, I'd be more than happy to. And, and I'm glad you guys went and looked. And 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 again, I'm just looking down the road. It always there's. Nobody there, no traffic, everything's okay today, you know, and then in six months, then we're back here discussing, and I think that we could probably head off a few issues, and besides, when I look at the yard, it kind of forms that irregular little indent there, uh, so I'd be in favor of if we could pull, pull it back to that corner line, which really doesn't chop out that much of your yard, if, if that's okay with you. 
Fair enough. Okay. Do we have a, we had, we had a motion? We had a motion and a second. Can we? Mike was the. That. Right, just to that corner. Yes and no, but if it helps make everything easier, sure, it's not going to be an issue. Amend, amend the motion. I agree to it as well. Okay. All right. So, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next items to be considered at future meetings. Mr. Roy Wesley. Jen, how are we doing on Potter Street with those cars as being repaired on Potter Street there? And there's a lot of cars there with no license plates and stuff like that. And, and uh, another question is about the signs, like Garcia Auto has a wooden sign out there. How long does that stay out there? Mr. Forrest. Uh, the first question about the car repair, if we're talking about the, the buildings on Potter Street. There's a couple of them. Yeah, the ones on Potter Street, those are allowable uses due to the industrial zoning of that section of the street. We are still working with the property owners. In fact, we had a meeting last week with the Potter Street property owners. Uh, albeit slowly, but that program to uh, get them all on board with putting uh, landscaping screening is moving forward. Uh, so we're hoping that that will, you know, come to fruition by hopefully sometime this fall. And, uh, you know, code enforcement has been over there trying to get them to get the vehicles pulled back. I know some citations have been issued, but as far as having the vehicles in the rear of the building, that is allowable in the industrial zoned areas. Uh, your other question about the the A-shaped signs, those are considered by definition sandwich board signs. Those were allowed in the new sign ordinance. Well, I say new, but it's probably six, eight, ten years old by now. Uh, they are limited in size and they have to be taken in every night. If they're not, then they're in violation. But I know we've had this discussion before. So. We have. and. I understand it's supposed to be brought in every night. We're starting to look like Stone Park, though. And I don't want that. If you would like staff to uh, bring forward a recommendation to remove that section from the sign ordinance, we can certainly do that. Uh, something to well, look at. Right. I mean, we can, we can look at that. I mean, certainly them being enforced, you know, A, the square, I know that there's a square foot Correct. number and that they're supposed to be brought in and they're supposed to be in certain locations and not on the public parkway and all those things. So maybe we first look at uh, a tighter scrutiny of the implementation of that or how they're being used at this point. Would that work for you, Mr. Wesley? Yeah, we talked about this before and we had a, where they would have a permit for like a garden center would allow certain time to put a sign out well, you guys can look at it. We'll come back. We're, yeah. We can't debate it this evening. Right. Right. Okay. So we'll put that on there. Any other items that uh, Alderman Eugene Wesley? Are we going to have a train station repair work on the next? I, I was hoping it was going to be this committee. You're yeah, talking talk about, about the, the roof and uh, uh, the painting and all that. I thought it was going to be on this last this committee, and it never made it. Yeah, we've gotten two bids for it, and they've both been well under ten thousand dollars. So I'm waiting for one more bid to come forward. So once we get that. Uh, you know, we can bring it forward to if you want to, or the city manager can just go ahead and approve it. I just want to repair it. It's all. Yeah. Okay. So you guys are working. It's all under control. Okay. okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mm -hmm. I did, I did. Motion carries. I think so. Call the Public Health Safety Judicial Committee to order. Let the records, uh, let the minute takers note the same people are here. 
Um, I make a motion to approve the minutes May 8, 2014. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Bike patrol. Mr. Jacobs been waiting to pedal around. Go ahead. Um, coming to you tonight with uh, basically an informational report. Uh, this came up in the middle of the budget process, I think it was February or March, uh, to look at a uh, what it would take to implement a bike patrol, should we implement a bike patrol. And uh, so tonight, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it, was, it was too late to put it in this year's budget, but tonight is an informational and uh, should council decide that it's something that they want to pursue further, uh, it would allow us time to start working on something like that even uh, before we encumber budget numbers. Um, Are you done? No. Well, go ahead. All right. Um, We're good to ask questions later. I, I, we did quite a bit of research into this and uh, you know, provided you with a fairly lengthy memo. Uh, we did talk to several other agencies and uh, kind of their successes and uh, problems with the program that they might have had or how it kind of evolved over the years. Uh, we sat down with a couple of them. We looked at some different policies. Uh, really what this has morphed into for a lot of agencies around here, other than your really big agencies that can dedicate full-time people to it all the time, is a more of a part-time, as time permits, uh, patrol type issue um, th that, you know, that would include times when you have enough officers that you can put them out on the street uh, with the bikes, uh, but with also the availability of using their squad car, uh, getting back to their squad car for patrol too. Uh, they do staff it for special events, uh, you know, such as parades like, like that we have coming up or fests or uh, things in the park. But, uh, you know, one of the biggest goals of any type of program like this is uh, increasing the contact with the community and the open communication. Uh, certainly, uh, I think if we had something like this in place, uh, it would only encourage uh, more contact with the public. Uh, we regularly do foot patrols now um, throughout mainly the higher density residential areas. Uh, we pull those on a regular basis. Uh, what this would allow is uh, the officers to be a little bit further away from their cars. You know, you, you can't be 10 minutes away from your car by foot. and. Uh, if we're just doing it on a, on a patrol, uh, as staff is available basis, and then uh, you know, all of a sudden the street gets busy, you've got to be able to get back to your car in somewhat of a reasonable time to say, hey, it's starting to get busy, I need to be available for regular patrol. So uh, that, that's the biggest goal, I think, of the program is increased public contacts. Uh, and that's kind of what it's evolved to in other agencies. Uh, some of the things, uh, if we were ever to do something like this, is uh, it would probably be a, uh, you know, they wouldn't necessarily leave from the station on a regular basis, but similar to what you see the Forest Preserve doing, uh, they go around to the different parks and they ride around. You can go to a business area or you could go, you could leave from the station, uh, but you're probably not going to go to the far northeast or southwest part of town uh, if you're not, if you don't have su sufficient patrolling at the time. Uh, one of the things we would have to do, and uh, while there's no state certification needed, I would highly recommend uh, there's a 32-hour training course that's put on. Uh, I've seen these classes put on uh, in Chicago, too, and the amount of stuff that they cover, uh, I think it would be very important not just to send someone out on a bike, but to put them through the training. Uh, some of those things are, uh, you know, basic physical fitness and injury avoidance. Uh, critical riding techniques, traffic strategies and approaches to calls, how to approach a vehicle. If you were to encounter a vehicle, you would stop uh, on that. Obviously, they wouldn't use, be used for normal traffic patrol. Uh, pursuits and takedowns, uh, if they do encounter something. And, uh, you know, just some other areas that they cover as far as basic safety. Uh, the costs, and, and you can read all the stuff that would have to be purchased with this. Uh, I would estimate on the high side, you know, we said $1,600 to $2,300. I would say per unit that you roll out, uh, go on the high side and say $2,500 a unit just to be safe uh, with all the equipment, the bikes, uh, the uniforms, everything that comes with it. So 
Uh, I guess in summary, uh, you know, it, it, it could be a very positive program for the city. Uh, it could only supplement our efforts to make more contact with the residents. Um, but I guess uh, we're just seeking your direction for the future on uh, if this is something you guys want to pursue further. Since was, this was Peter Jacobs thing, we'll let you go first. Okay, if you could give me a little latitude, I did do some research on this. And um, I just want to kind of give the, the 10 advantages the, of bicycle patrol. Would you like to wait until the rest of the council <coughs> and then rebuttal on them? No, why don't I give these and then the council could hear what I, you know. Here's some of the research I did. Okay, uh, okay. go ahead. First of all, right now there's over 50,000 bike police in the U.S. National statistics, the population of a town from 10 to 24,000. 52% of police departments use a bike patrol. Um, the advantages of our uh, bikes are less threatening than patrol vehicles. Other bicyclists, bicyclists are more accepting of bike patrol officers. Bicycle patrols result in more than twice as many contact with the public than vehicle patrols, and that's one of my main reasons I brought this forward. Um, bicycle police helps officers to quickly transition from their traditional law enforcement duties to more service-oriented work. Perpetrators don't notice bike patrols. Bike patrols can go where traditional police vehicles can't. Um, bicycle officers can use all of their senses to detect illegal activity. Um, the cycles have other uses such as targeted enforcement, surveillance, tra traffic enforcement, and public order. And uh, bicycles cost much less purchase to purchase and maintain than per traditional pr uh, patrol cars, so it would save money on gas for the vehicles. And that's it. Thank you. That was, e that was easy. Greg, I have a question for you on um, your staff. Yes. I'm going to put you on the spot here. What's the police officers for you about this? I think there's a positive uh, overall view of it. Uh, you know, as with any new program we roll out, whether it be crisis intervention team officers or any new thing, uh, until the specifics kind of come out, you never have a complete grasp of who would volunteer for it. You know, we, we have specialty officers, you know, drug task force, canine officers, uh, SWAT guys. It's until you roll it out, you don't get a, a full view of how many are, are fully interested. I didn't survey them to say how many of you would be interested, but there is some interest and I think some general uh, thoughts that it would be a positive program. Um, certainly if, uh, if there was zero interest after saying, hey, they want to look at this further and there's still a lot more work to do if we were to roll something out, I wouldn't go buy anything until we knew we had people that definitely wanted, wanted to do something like that. So let me go a little further. Yeah. You being the chief, what would you feel about it? I'm, a, I'm for it. Okay. All of them, Eugene Wesley. Appreciate all that research you did, Mr. Jacob, but here's, you said there's 5,200 people on bikes? No, I, I, in a population of 10 to 24,000, 52% of police departments use bike patrols. Okay, is that counting Chicago? Because I know Chicago uses it all the time. Again, the population is 10 to 24,000. Okay. If Chicago has 10 to 24,000 people, then yes. Here, here's my concern about this. First of all, I'm taking officer out of the squad car, okay? And according to the memo, hear me out here, we might have to buy two or three bikes because according to the height of a person, according to the memo that was stated here, okay? The other thing is, if we had a downtown area like Naperville or Rosemont or something like that, I would have no problem voting for this 100%. But to focus on mostly one area that I'm, I, I'm hearing half the time up here, we're already in there doing foot patrol, okay? Georgetown, we're already in there. To have a bike patrol, and, and, and my question is, so if a guy's out on his own on that bike and he wipes out, don't, shouldn't they try travel in partners on bike patrol? I know, I believe my task of travels with two. Um, I'll ask the chief that. I would, 
I would say the uh, discussion about height, I threw that out as just to try and lay everything out there. That, you know, that if you're six, eight inches between officers, that's a consideration, you know, that maybe it extends beyond the bike seat height. So okay. it, it is a consideration. I don't think it's a completely eliminated factor. Okay, but it's in the middle. As far as uh, traveling together, uh, you know, we have the radios. We travel alone 99% of the time. The officers are alone until they get sent to a call together. Uh, foot patrol, sometimes we'll do together, but there's a lot of times it's just one person going out and walking, walking foot patrol. So it, because we have the radios and of the training, I don't have as many concerns about one person going out at a time because I think it frequently would be just one officer at a time due to our staffing levels. You're not going to be generally sending two out. For special events, then, you know, when, when you're hiring people to come in just for the special events, then you probably would send two out together. So well, let me ask, the, the men manning uh, on police officers per shift, how many would we have to have on shift? What's the minimum manning for police officers on duty per shift? Our minimum manning is a watch commander, and then we always have three to five officers. It always depends on training days, rotating days off, vacation. So if we had a, a sergeant and three patrol, patrol officers, probably not going to unless it's going to be a short-term stint uh, neck close to your car. If you've got five officers, that's when there's going to be more freedom, but they're going to have their radio and say, all right, starting to get busy out there. You know, we, we've got a couple guys tied up on a domestic or a traffic arrest. Time to go back to my car and be available to respond anywhere in town within, you know, a couple minutes. May, may I do a couple more? Go ahead. And the other concern is, so we going so if a guy's on vacation that means we drop our patrol men down to four so there's basically there's a men manning you have to have on the street at all time according to our policies i i assume we have a policy on that so if a guy's on vacation actually how much time are we actually looking at to have this on the street to be used or is it going to be put in the shed and we're going to use it probably twice a year, three times a year. I, I, I mean, I just, or you're gonna come back here after a year that this project at work, we're gonna put these bikes up for sale and we just sent all these guys for this training and all the other stuff. Again, if it was a downtown area like Naperville, Rosemont, a, a river walk or, or something, I would have no problem passing this 100%. I just have a problem passing it right now like this. I, I really just, I just don't see us using it. We got, we got, we got one in Dumay, we got one in SWAT, we got officer in the school. I mean, how much more are we gonna strap our guys? Now you're gonna ask me, come back here next year and tell me I need three more officers because we just introduced a bike patrol. I, I can't sell it, I'm sorry. That won't happen, but I, I, I don't know the exact number of what will be used, and as I mentioned in the memo, some of these towns started it as more of a regularly scheduled patrol, and they have tailored it back. So, I mean, I've talked to the agencies around us, you know, specifically one that's kind of similar to us, and it's more evolved into, and part of that I think also, and what he told me was due to the changing economy, when they really had to cut back on officers, it affected their bike patrol. Um, so it's consideration. <coughs> I, I, I don't deny that at all. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go back to Alderman Jacobs because it's his. That's okay. I asked you about this if you mm -hmm. wanted to wait. Okay. It's his, it's his uh, thing that he wants. So let Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, something Eugene said, this is for one area. My suggestion was to have an officer rotate from ward to ward, not just in one area that you're thinking of, and that's what Greg understands. That's my first uh, thing. Um, the next thing, we do have trails in the city, bike paths in the city. We are trying to, to build a downtown here. so. This is not putting them in this summer. This would be to get it for next year's budget and start preparing for it. So unless we're stopping the downtown movement going forward, then I don't see why we would be against this. So then I make a motion to take one from the 
Thank you. Okay, we got a train station. There's our downtown so far. <laughs> Autumn and Winger. Thank you. Uh, initially, I wasn't sure um, how I felt about this, um, but but I have given it further consideration. And um, Alderman Jacob, I do appreciate your research, as well as Chief Vesta. Um, I believe we can start out with one or two units. And um, so we'll start out somewhat small. And I do like the flexibility that this will allow. So we will have, um, I don't see it as we'd have a bike patrol unit and they're always on bicycles that I see the car rack feature. So this is something, and correct me if I'm uh, wrong, Chief, but the bike racks would be on one or two vehicles and then the officer can take the bicycle out to the site, get on the bicycle, do the patrol, and if they're called to, to a um, emergency, they can get to their car quickly and, and go to that site, correct? Yeah, and, and that's how, if we did this, I would envision it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we split the patrol officers up by uh, north or south beats, too. Mm -hmm. So if that day you're really going to want them to, to, you know, to focus on the north area, you're going to assign that officer if they're, you know, if the, if the, call level allows it, you're probably going to assign him to the north. So, you know, let's say he's, you know, near the station and he's and he's riding the bike and there's a call four blocks away. He's not going to go to the car. He's just going right. to go there right. in, in, in that type thing, too. So there is a dual response possibility to it, um, but they've got to have the ability to, if it gets busy, because uh, I don't envision right now hiring them anyone back for overtime just to ride no. the bikes around. If it starts to get busy, and, and you know we do that all the time, where you, all of a sudden, hey, I need to, uh, you know, the guys are on a rest. There's a domestic going on. I need to go get back to my car to be available to respond to the other area of town too that I might not be in. So. Okay. Thank you. How do, uh, Greg? How do you patrol the reservoir right now? Well, it, it's it's difficult. Uh, we can get access to it with a vehicle, but it's not very vehicle friendly. Uh, you know, we, we do regular checks down at the reservoir here, but as far as if you want to go around the whole reservoir to go check it, it's about three quarters of a mile around. To go on foot, it's fine and we'll do that, but to be that far away your car on foot and it all of a sudden gets busy out there, it's a lot easier to come back on a different type of transportation than than uh, running. So, okay. Alderman Samarski, Chief, is there something I don't know if Mr. Bond can step in that the union might try to change the pay structure on something like this? It, it's unlikely. They're still doing patrol. They're just doing it. You know, you you use your patrol guys are walking now and in the in the vehicle. Obviously, it's something you give the union notice about, uh, and I think the chief was talking about you know working it with those who are interested. So it would be you know initially be on a voluntary basis, and to the extent that there's you know additional duties or responsibilities down the road, uh, you now that's something for consideration regarding compensation. But generally, it's just another assignment that they're being provided, which is within the scope of management's authority. And, and, and to address that, I would say there's a number of specialty things that they do that there's no additional compensation. It's many of the people want to do something different, something extra, and just have that av availability to do it. And uh, so we would certainly work with them and make sure there's interest from officers wanting to do it. Um, but I don't see that as being an issue right now. Follow. Go ahead. The only I'm not opposed to it, like Alderman Wesley said. Um, more maybe more along the, down the line when we do build a downtown or this prints for downtown structures do come. Uh, the only opposition I have is very seasonable. If it's mm -hmm. raining, they're not going to be riding a bike. They're not going to ride in snow. It's, you got what four months out of the year at best. Yeah. <coughs> so other than that, that's all I have. Alderman Woods. Thank you, Alderman Wesley. Yes, sir. Can I, um, you know, all the concerns, you know, are valid, and, and Alderman Jacobs got some good points. I guess my 
my concern is where we're going to fit this and what does the policy really look like you know so it's nice to say that we're going to add bike guys but we really don't have anybody I mean we're pretty taken up doing what we do so we're going to take a guy out of a car and that's okay uh, but anytime that we institute a policy or do something I know what happens everybody develops an expectation so we try it knowing and saying that you know we're going to do it when we can weather permitting staffing permitting and now we're going to get the calls that I don't see the guys out on the bike so before I really would move forward I, I mean I'd be for you know putting the program together but I want to see a policy along with that program what are we thinking of how this is going to work and how it's going to look too besides just the dollar aspect of it because I, I know talking to other chiefs that there are some issues and going back and forth and it's not as easy as just throwing a rack on the car right getting off your bike riding around and then hearing the call running tying your bike up and jumping on the car that all sounds good but so thank you I I'm actually for this <clears throat> and a couple of questions if I may one it would be I know we spend a lot of time and money on uh, you know coffee with cops and you know guys on top of uh, Dunkin Donuts and over at the swimming pool you know night out with the cops and all that good stuff and I'm sure that that is for good reason and that's to meet the residents and I think <clears throat> one of the most important things that you're seeing here is from time to time of course that this would increase meeting some of the the residents um, and I see that being an important aspect for uh, for our police department and, and, and many others. Then I also see it as a tool, because you were saying that uh, you believe that it can, it can cut down on, uh, on crime. And I also believe that um, you probably would be intelligent enough to know when to use these and when not to use these. So I would, again, I would, I would give that up to, to you to decide when to use these. It would just be like, you know, I'm not saying a canoe, and I'm sure we have a canoe. If we do need a canoe, we have that. Mm -hmm. If we do need bikes, we have those. Um, we're not talking about a lot of money here, probably 10 grand, to help um, with the safety of our community and also to get that interaction with the police. I would like to see this program go further in the recommendation of what Alderman Wood said and some policies. So I guess I would uh, make a motion to uh, continue or make a recommendation to continue. I would second that. And, and if I could touch real quick on the, uh, on the goals, that would certainly be something that we could kind of come back with a picture of what this would look like. I don't think, you know, it, we need a definite decision tonight, but this would allow us during the budget process to know, are you guys even interested in this? And if you are, we'll be able to come back with, you know, we know about what the costs are now, you know, uh, but what would it look like and maybe allow us to work in November and December to really identify this stuff and not wait until the budget's approved in April and then go up, oh, the classes are full, we can't even get anyone in classes again and then delay it another year if we do want to do it. So it, it'll allow us to get on wait lists for classes and all that too, so. Mayor. Uh, Chief, uh, I can tell you on the foot patrol, I've had residents tell me that uh, they really like seeing that presence and makes them feel safer. I'm sure the bike patrol will do the same. My question, my question is, I'd like to hear from the officers. You should take a poll. If the council wishes to do this, do we have guys or girls yeah. that are willing to do this? Because if nobody, everybody says, well, I really don't want to get on a bike. You know, we're kind of forcing them. And I guess we could if we wanted to, but, <laughs> but um, you know, I know you're going to look for volunteers. So are there, do we have officers that are willing to partake in this? And then the other thing, I saw that 20% uh, you guys did a study and about 20 out of 320% of them had 
more injuries and things like that. I, I mean, I know that's where the training would come in, and hopefully that we would. Right. Uh, so two parts to that. Uh, Definitely before we put this into next year's budget recommendation, I'll make sure that there's plenty of interest in it. And, and that is important. I, doing something like this uh, and any of the specialty stuff we do, uh, there's got to be buy-in, and uh, we would make sure that that's the case. And then, uh, you know, in talking to uh, agencies around, that study was a uh, nationwide study that was done uh, by the Police Mountain Bike Association, I know. Um, most of those were cuts and scrapes, and yeah, it does come down to training. They said if you went to training, those even went down further. So there's always a risk, um, right. and, and there is an increased risk for, you know, you don't have the squad car around you. You're, there's more chance of, you know, falling off a curb than there is, you know, generally in driving, in driving the squad. So uh, it's a consideration, but the ones I've talked to around us, uh, I know an agency right next to us, they, they've never had an injury, according to my contact with him, uh, that rose to any type of reportable injury, so. I, I'm sure the residents would appreciate the presence. Tony, you got anything to say? Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. How many communities um, around our area that have bike patrols? Uh, the actual the, towns. I don't know the exact number, but I know the ones to the east and the west of us do. And, uh, so Itasca and... Itasca does, Bentsville does. Uh, I don't know the extent of Addison, mm -hmm. uh, but there's several in the area that do have some type of, of uh, bike patrol. Uh, Forest Preserve, when they're coming around and going to the preserves, they're always, you know, they always, a lot of times have their bike on the back of their squad during the, the warmer months, so... Uh, it's certainly common in the area. Uh, it's not an uncommon thing, so. And also, uh, Alderman Jacob answered a lot of my questions. And, um, and I think it's a good thing for Georgetown in my community. They'll be looking for something like that. Thank you. Well, I think, Peter Jacobs, you're winning right here right now, but we'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Eugene Westley. Hi, it's information only, okay, but my, I will address my concern. Obviously, the mayor said they've been walking around, and Tony has said they've been walking around in Georgetown, so when is the officer going to walk the fourth ward, or ward three, and ward four? So, I go back to my initial question. If we got walking in Georgetown, and we got walking Georgetown. Okay, President. again, walking in Georgetown, where is the rest of the citizens' ward for that situation? Frank Rosario's ward, there ain't no officer walking the street. Ward 4, there ain't no officer walking the street. Roy and Art Woods, there ain't no officer walking down the street. Well, they might be in Georgetown. So, oh, that is Georgetown. But again, <laughs> we go back to the first argument that I had. We addressing a bike patrol thing, it seems like it's more for Georgetown. So the point is, they walk in Georgetown, but what about the other wards walking? I would actually offer that I think this would increase it citywide because right now to do a foot patrol, walking patrol, you're going to go not just to your higher density housing areas where you're going to encounter a lot of people. That's for the most effectiveness for the you know for the short period of time that you have in a day to spend time on a foot patrol you're going to go to the apartment complexes the the townhouse complexes the, the areas that we've had more nuisance complaints that's why we spend some time in those areas so devon we, avenue is not a it's a subdivision and we don't do a walk patrol up there that we I'm have sorry, where? up by thorndale and we had an officer up on Thorndale there in that townhouse development that we had nuisance complaints on? Not necessarily no, so. foot patrols, but you don't have the foot traffic up there. We do regular patrols. Uh, tonight before I came up here, uh, one of the sergeants was pulling a patrol in an apartment complex just as, as a drive-through patrol. We do it all the time and we adjust to each area of town. This would actually, in my opinion, increase the area that get face-to-face, person-to-person contact even more than in a squad car. All right, but then let's go, go back to this. Then I suggest if we're doing a foot patrol over by Georgetown right now, and I, we have a major potential 
major incident going on in the fourth ward, maybe we should have someone out on foot patrol in that area that we have a problem with then too. And, and I would say that we do, like Central Park, we put guys out there and we'll, we'll walk through there or. Okay. 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 This is information only. <laughs> so let's just do a, a, a consent to see if we should go forward okay. or not. Um, can we do a like a roll call vote on this to to get more information to? Uh, There's a motion. There is a motion on the floor, though. I don't know if we. Have. Yeah, to go forward. It's a recommendation. Okay. Motion to continue. It's a motion to continue. For next year's budget. Right. For next year's budget. For next year's yeah. budget. Yeah. Because we're... Wait, already. you want to talk, Mr. Attorney? Sure, I'm here. I may as well speak. What, basically what you're doing is you, staff needs direction. Do they expend additional staff resources to, to gather more information or not? So really, an affirmative vote is giving staff direction to continue to drill down on some of the concerns that have been raised. A negative vote would take it off the, the plate for, of staff at this juncture. Thank you. Well, you want to comment again? Just for the first time, not again. Uh, not the first Just time. Quick. You ran my meetings last week. Okay. That was last week. One more time. That's it. Okay. I just wanted to go back to the policy. I mean, that was a prime example of matching up expectations. So I'm for the bikes, but I got to see how it's going to be implemented. And I think everybody else would like to see how that will work throughout the ward system and, and and with our system so sure with that uh, I'm in favor we'll start there Ma uh, madam <laughs> chief are you I mean uh, secretary or <laughs> minute taker yes the roll call is what that's only said <laughs> it's information it's to, right. to spend right. staff time on it what mayor basically they made the motion all we really need is direction that's what we, I'm doing yeah Either way, you can, if you say yes, yes to the motion to continue, it's the same thing, direction or not. Call it whatever you want. Yeah. Either way, it's the same direction. So we have Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes, but I have one follow-up question, public safety. No more bikes. We're done. No, it ain't about that. Okay, go ahead. So tomorrow, I expect one of our officers walking the fourth ward over by the issues that we have, because I'm not. Okay. Are you? Can yeah, we, what? Can we come? Sure. Go ahead. The the chief will take care of all the operations in the city. As he needs to, as he sees fit. Yeah. Okay. We, we're not going to start dictating to the police department how he runs the operation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Items, I got it. Items we consider. Anything? No. Motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. How about five minutes? How about two this minutes? Be fast, no? Are we going to go right, right to it then? Or do you want to? He wants five minutes. A break? Break. Yeah, we'll take a five minute break before we start public work. Make it six minutes. Roll call taker note that the same people are here. I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, the minutes of the meeting on May 8th, 2014. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That passes. At this time, I'd like to um, kind of go out of order a little bit and uh, ask a resident if they would like to, um, to speak on. Uh, yeah, I'll make If you can go to the. Uh, State your name and address. Uh, Melissa Stoll, 145 South Cedar 
in Wooddale. And I wanted a few minutes of time to talk about uh, the work that's continuing and get, supposedly getting finished up on the street repairs starting last fall. And, and all that would of be on Cedar. Right? That Cedar Street, yes, between south of Montrose and all the way down to the end, and also including the Montrose area. And currently, the, the latest thing going on with it, that despite there, there have been good things, like workers on the street have been excellent, you know, respectful, friendly, and whatnot. But the slapdash of this work going in, starting from the beginning and continuing this fall, is, is ongoing. And one of the things I wanted to point out was the quality of soil that's going into the parkways. So just a moment. I brought some examples of the soil that is clean dirt that's supposed to be going into the parkways. I think we're going to need you to get back to the microphone. Thank you. Thanks. I could have taken wheelbarrows down the street and just gone along and picked things up out of this. With, I've just got a box full of examples. Asphalt with white pavement. I'm sorry, a lot of you have been driving by, but you've missed the get out of your car, I think, and gotten an into the touchy-feely to see what actually is being dumped in there. And uh, so I wanted to bring you some soil samples of what's going in down there on Cedar and also on Montrose, though Montrose has benefited with more of the homes having the pulverized, clean topsoil, and frankly, you can see the difference a block away if you had two piles of them sitting them next to each other. So that's all. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Um, just like to just kind of um, make note of the fact that I believe that a lot of the soil was removed. Uh, Matt, is that, uh, is that so? Soil, um, approximately six loads, uh, to my knowledge, were removed um, by uh, the contractor last week. Um, other locations where soil was dumped, um, each pack of soil has been um, tested and either approved uh, by Trotter before sod has been laid, or um, sod or the the dirt will be reground um, on site and must meet, um, must be approved by Trotter before uh, sod can be laid at any location upon Cedar or Montrose. Okay, um, maybe tomorrow 
you can check into that to make sure that it uh, was done. Maybe you can get back to me and I can get back to the resident. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're moving on. Um, oh, go ahead, Art, do you have a question? I, well, I was just gonna ask who's, who's in charge of that project so that the homeowner doesn't have to find the stuff and bring us the box of goodies. Well, go ahead. Tr Trotter is the engineer on site. Um, um, we have been in contact with them regarding this. This happened um, last week. Um, forget which day it was. Um, I think it was third. Yeah, Friday, Friday afternoon. Right. Um, Alderman Jacob had called. Um, that was late Friday afternoon when the initial um, bad loads of dirt were were brought in. Um, those loads of dirt were. Um, since pulled out um, by at least one o'clock on Monday afternoon, um, and no sod was put on any of those areas where the load, those um, those questionable loads of dirt were dumped. Then we're, Go ahead. Where were we at with finishing up this project? It's lingered, I know, mm -hmm. and I don't want to. Yeah, the um, the at current completion or the completion date as of right now is May 29th. Were, were we not like at the 18th, or did I just have a wrong number in my head? Um, we were at, um, we were pretty close to that point, um, and uh, we've had a number of rain days. Um, we basically lost all of last week. Um, there's a difference between a rain date and um, a date that you can't work at all. Um, there are um, critical paths that need to be, be able to be done. Um, those critical paths were not um, be able to be met during certain days because of the weather events. Um, so as of right now, um, due to them, um, uh, um, during, due to the weather events, the 29th of May is, is final completion date. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Eugene. So my question is, why did those even get dumped out of the dump truck if Trotter's on site every time there's construction out there? I, mean, I, I just don't see when they dumping this, they didn't notice it. We Go ahead, Matt. Pay a lot of money. Um, Trotter was on site when this when these loads were coming in. Um, the first load that came in, the truck was stopped. Um, the um, the gentleman that was out here, um, um, Leonard was actually on vacation. Tom was out here um, working uh, that day, um, both Friday and Monday and Tuesday. Um, Tom was uh, inspecting a load while another load passed and was started to be dumped. When they started dumping it, he ran over, stopped that load from being dumped. Um, there was at a point in time, um, my understanding, and I was not on site during this, but there was multiple loads coming in at once towards the end of the day, and uh, he just was not able to stop all the trucks before they were dumped. But he also, um, if you would have been out there on Monday, um, and Tuesday, there was large areas that were um, painted uh, with large pink X's. Those were all the loads that were to be removed, and all those have been removed, and um, new soil has been placed in those locations. Yeah, Eugene, those were the loads that we saw uh, with the big red X's on them. But my concern is we right, yeah, the engineer it's, from some big dollars yeah. to oversee a project, yeah. and we allow that to happen. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to, they did their job. They did stop it. They... I mean, obviously, um, it was it was put on the ground, but they caught it before it was a final product. So I think that they did do their job. Okay, Roy. You know, Matt, I was out there today, and of course they're out there laying the sod and stuff now. But those that sod has been sitting there probably two, three days now on those pallets. You know that sod sweats and everything. Mm -hmm. Now it's probably going to sit there. If they don't finish that sod tomorrow, I asked Trotter, if they don't finish it tomorrow, where, he told me that the city's not allowing them to work on the Saturday or Sunday or Monday. So my question is, if they don't finish those pallets, there's quite a few pallets out there, this, the sod's probably dying now, what happens? Okay, um, I was just told this is not on, a, on the agenda and we can't uh, 
really discuss this any further. But um, Matt, if you can obviously look into the concerns of uh, the aldermen's. Uh, thank you. Uh, have to move on at this point. Um, we have a presentation for the uh, treatment plant uh, informational update. And I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Matt. Thank you, Alderman. Um, here tonight we have Mark Hardy from HR Green. Um, council, I'd ask for an update on um, the weight with water treatment plant. We've got a, a little bit from phase one, kind of some uh, the final pictures, and then uh, we'll go into some a uh, little bit from phase uh, 1A, and, now we'll, and then we'll go into 1B. So Mark Hardy will take over from here. Thanks, Matt. So we'll just dive in and look at some pictures. Um, this is the new admin building uh, looking towards the west. You'll notice one of the few pieces of green grass on the site. Um, and that is actually going to stay for a while. Um, but this is kind of the back side of the admin building with the lab being on the right, some offices in the middle, and, and the side entry door on the left. This is some pictures in the inside. The picture on the left is, is the lab and the uh, casework. Uh, that particular uh, picture is the fume hood. The picture on the right is the uh, break area, the kitchen area, um, where staff can come and eat their new lunches and so on. Here's some more pictures. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, Violet's area, the, the receptionist's uh, Clerk, the picture on the upper left is, is an office where we have a combined office where a couple of the foremen uh, have their offices in there. Picture in the lower left, I believe, is, is Brad Gilson, the superintendent's office. Here's that same piece of green grass looking the other way towards the east. That's building 50. Um, that's the secondary uh, treatment building. And the, on the left is the new aeration basin that was added. Here's some interior pictures of the piping. This is uh, primarily the, the one on the lower right is, is the upper level. The rest of them are the lower level. But this is where we pump uh, the upper left is where the big clarifier, the water comes in from the clarifiers uh, and <coughs> it gets uh, returned or or onto the next process. The pumps, the picture in the lower left is some sludge pumping from the bottom of the clarifiers over to the digesters. And just, uh, just uh, some other functions are in there as well. Here's the new, the, the building 50 we just saw on the picture on the right. It's on the right hand side. This is looking um, to the east with uh, the, the new aeration basin. There was four there before we added a fifth one to increase our capacity. The picture on the left is the new clarifier. This is looking, is inside the plant looking out towards Irving Park Road. The, and that's the clarifier with the cover, with the cover on it. So that was just a, a quick summary of the major structures on 1A. Now we'll transition into 1B. Um, this is just to, to recapture some of why we're doing what we're doing is to replace aging equipment and improve, improve performance and reduce o &M. These pictures are of the old screen, uh, which has reached the end of its design life. We're replacing that with a new screen that's, that's more effective, more automated, um, and will get us you know, at least 20 years down the future with, with the new equipment. Here on the right-hand side, it's just some, some concrete uh, repair, some issues, some of the reasons why these basins were getting to their end of their life. So showing, showing some age. Uh, the picture on the left is, is a method in which some of the, the screenings are put in a dumpster, some of it that, that's dried and ready to be disposed of, um, but just is uh, in a little state of disrepair. So here's a, an overall to refresh your memory. The, the uh, base of these structures in red are phase 1A. 
The purple is 1B. So right now, <clears throat> we're currently working on three structures, uh, building 20 in the lower center, building 100 to the north and west, and then building 70 uh, was a little bit staggered. It, that excavation of that started this spring, whereas 20 and 100 was started this winter. And then <clears throat> that, that'll keep us busy for most of the summer, but towards the latter part of the summer, we'll start on building 30 and then 90, and then the standby generators are for this to the north. So with this project, there, there's a few challenges to overcome. One, similar to 1A, we have to keep the plan in operation during construction, and that's, that's a fairly difficult endeavor when considering the, the small footprint that we have on, on site, and it causes a contractor to haul in dirt and haul out dirt and can only do a few operations at a time. And, um, and then there's always the, the case where we have to keep the flow coming in and we can't cut off, we can't just, if we have to do work on a raw influent main, we can't just stop it, you know, because we got to make some special provisions to either bypass, pump around, and basically jump through a lot of hoops to be able to keep the plant in operation. And then, of course, the limited space. <clears throat> it just don't, don't have a lot of real estate, and we have adjacent structures that we can't create a big hole and have big side slopes going back. So. And, then, and then we've also, this, during the winter and spring, we've, we've run into some, some telephone conduits and some other buried utilities that we didn't know existed or were not properly indexed on old plans. And, typical things that you run into when you renovate a plant that's been renovated several times. There's a lot of different generations and things get lost uh, in the transition from the different projects. So this, I guess, uh, this picture on the right is, is Building 20, the one closest to Irving Park Road. And you'll notice on the side, the, uh, there's, the wood, there's wood boards that with H piles that we um, required the contractor to do to basically allow him to do a vertical excavation instead of two to one side slopes with a big hole opening up. So you're looking at about 20 foot deep hole there. Um, but we're, we had conflicts with the admin building, existing admin building to the north, Irving Park on the south, and Memorial Park on the east. So we were very boxed in in this particular structure. So the picture on the left shows it a little bit more clearly where we had the H piles around the perimeter and, and wood lagging in between to allow us to drill uh, that, that hole straight down. <coughs> so that's in the early stages. The picture on the right, you can still see the H piles around the perimeter. We've backfilled in and since this picture was taken, we've pulled those H piles out of the ground so they're no longer there. They serve their purpose, um, but now we've poured the lid on that hole, and those silver boxes are hatches, six hatches to get access down into the pumps that are down inside, that will be down inside that 20 foot deep hole. And this is just another picture, we're a little bit further along, the picture on the left is still that, that wet well, that, that 20 foot deep hole, and now we've built a, a wall, foundation wall around the perimeter to make our building a little bigger, it's not all needs to be that deep, but we have some equipment that will have to sit up on that ground floor to, to make the building a little bit bigger. And so the picture on the right is just some more steel rebar reinforcing kind of around the outside of building 20, and that's looking towards the existing admin building. Uh, now transitioning over to the excess flow facility structure 100, the picture on the left is looking towards Maher Lumber. Uh, there were doing the bottom slab, building it up. Picture on the right is looking that same general direction, southeasterly uh, or southwesterly, I guess, um, that the, with the walls getting higher, built structures out of the ground. You can see the concrete ledge, that's about where ground level is going to be, and then everything above that is going to be brick, and then our brick will extend up uh, about five feet higher than, than that top of that wall and, and is, is part of our screening wall. 
And this picture right here in, on the right-hand side, that corner right there is about where the front entrance gate will be on the main access road into the plant. Uh, next structure, the final effluent building, structure 70. This is over by the water tower. Um, the picture on the left is the very, when they first started excavating, that's the deepest part of the structure is right there. That's actually going to be outside the building. There's a wet well right adjacent to the building where we have our effluent pumps. Um, and then the picture on the right is that slab being poured and coming up out of the ground. Um, here we're looking again um, easterly towards the water tower, more form work, more rebar coming up out of the ground. Picture on the right, those square boxes that you see kind of halfway up the wall, those are where slide gates are going to go, um, where the UV disinfection is on the right um, and the disc filters are on the left. But, so that's kind of going to be the, the northerly or easterly most part of the building and it's going to be coming towards you closer to Irving Park. Here's a, a little bit more of what I was talking about. Um, this is influent raw sewage mains coming into the plant. Uh, the picture on the left, uh, the flow direction is, is coming from the city into the picture on the left and then it flows to the picture on the right and then it goes into our raw sewage pump station. But the picture on the left is an example of where we're building a manhole over the top of an existing pipe. We, we poured concrete as, as the base of that. So we can't put a normal manhole in here because we have to essentially build it around that pipe and build the structure. And then when we get ready to switch it over, the contractor will go in and saw cut an opening into that existing pipe. And kind of it's, it's more or less of a, a build around an existing structure is, is what we have to do to, to be able to keep that. All the while, raw sewage is coming in the, like it did before through that pipe. But we're going to redirect the flow and put it into a new structure when we're done. And the picture on the right is, is this one is, is more of a conventional manhole installation where we're um, building it with it uh, from the base up. And that's a 48-inch pipe getting ready to go uh, into the new raw pump station. I apologize. I have a cold, so my voice is, is a little wearing out here. So <clears throat> uh, regarding schedule, the, we've, we're working on those three structures. We're going to be built structure 30 the, is the preliminary treatment building. There's quite a lot going in there. That's going to be a, one of the major buildings on when this project is done. Uh, the digesters, structure 90, a standby generator up to the northerly edge of the project site. And then, and then towards the end, we will demolish the existing admin building and construct a parking lot there. It'll be one of our main parking lots where the existing admin building is. The, the site will look a lot different when, when that happens, but that's going to be towards the end. Um, and then we have some site grading and landscaping. The, towards the end, I'll, I'll show you the rendering to kind of refresh your memory on, on what the finished project will look like. The uh, project schedule, we started in November. We contractor worked through the winter and for the most part was, was quite productive in the winter even though it was cold. We had a few breaks in the, in the cold weather to be able to get the hole dug and then they enclosed it and they were able to work for several weeks uh, heating it inside the tarped area and, and were able to make progress. Uh, substantial completion is June 17th, 2015 with final completion July 2015. Um, like I said, they, were made, they, they lost a little ground what they planned for. They, they, they had a reasonable schedule for the winter and they knew they were going to have days where they couldn't work, but the schedule that they set out at the beginning of the winter, they, they missed it by three to four weeks. They didn't get quite as much done, but um, the end of February and March was pretty reasonable and they made up a couple, about three of those weeks. So they're currently, they're within a week of their original schedule that, that they laid out. Um, this, just to uh, refresh your memory, the, the engineer's original 
opinion of probable cost was 20.49 million. The actual bid amount, when we added in uh, Building 70, the uh, final effluent building was 20 million 340 thousand, and we've had we've had uh, some deduct change orders. We have some added change orders, but right now we're we're slightly below our bid amount, so we're 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 tracking nicely at this point. And this is the uh, the rendering that we did at the beginning stages. This, <clears throat> but keep in mind, it doesn't have the building 70, the one on the far right, the the final effluent building that was that was added into the project uh, after this rendering was made, and also <coughs> the admin building is not um, should be on the lower left. That that's the that's the uh, the building in the lower left. You see, that's the raw sewage pump station. Irving Park is is on the right hand side um, so that's building 20 and then the new admin building is is uh, kind of north east of of that uh, structure and then building 50 is what you see kind of upper left hand corner and the screening wall going around the final clarifier a lot of that is is gonna it looks similar and, and put trees and some other landscaping in front of that screening wall and you can't see structure 100 on the far left but we have um, portions of a screening wall over there as well. So with that, um, I'm, I'm done with, with the presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Eugene? I have one question, and, and maybe Brad can answer this. With the bills that we've been paying already, has the state been on time reversing that money back to us? I just, I mean, the financing, I, Uh, correct, yes. Uh, so far we've submitted, uh, this, the council has approved five payments on the list of bills. Right. Um, five of those have, all five of those have been remitted to the state. Four of those so far we've been reimbursed for. Uh, they're currently, as promised, running about 30 days from the date of submission to getting it back. So, so far, um, you know, the documents that H.R. Green's prepared for us to send down to the state, the state has uh, rather enjoyed. So, they're, we're rolling along just oh, as... Oh. All I want to do is make sure our money is coming with that EPA loan. Can anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, well, Mark, thank you. Oh, uh, go ahead. Just Please. wanted to thank you for that presentation. Sure. Very informative. No problem. Okay, thank you again, Mark. Okay, moving along. We have um, report and recommendation, pay request partial number two. Instaform Technology USA LLC for the Sanitary Source System Rehabil Rehabilitation Project Year One and the not to exceed amount of $23,868.16. That is my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions? Uh, Eugene? Matt? Um, yes, this is part of the RJN contract from last year. Any other questions? Do we need a roll call? Okay, roll call, please. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Murray Wesley? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. And that passes. Report and recommendation approval of manhole rehabilitation contract with Kim Construction Company of Steger, Illinois in an amount not to exceed $250,990. That is my motion. Do I have a second? second. Any second? Second. Any questions? Go ahead, Tony. This um, manhole rehabilitation, is that going to help? when their areas flood in the low lying areas. So what happens in a situation when the street floods? So when they seal these manhole covers, will the water still gush through there and end up in people's basements? I'm a little confused how that's gonna work. Go ahead, man. Um, basically with this, we're, what we're trying to do with this program, the I&I &I program, infiltration and inflow, inflow and infiltration program, is to keep the storm water out of the sanitary sewer system. So, whereas in the past, 
that may have alleviated some flooding. Hopefully what this is doing is to remove that water from the sanitary sewer system. So I will ultimately, um, and if Kathy, if I'm saying something wrong, Kathy, let me know. Okay, um, Kathy from RJN is here, um, is that we want to keep the water out of the sanitary sewer system. So we're So putting, it's really not going to help it's not the residents? Gonna, no, that's that not, not going to help, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't have ever helped. So we're trying to do, trying to get it back to the way that it's supposed to be. Any other questions? Roll call. Oh, Eugene. Matt. Um, this year's INI project, we had three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars budgeted in the CIP. Um, this this is part of a new project. This was bidded out and opened the bids on the 29th of April. So this, yeah. Engin the engineering is already done for this. this so this is going to be uh, an, an active an active work contract. Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, Eugene. Again, I ask the question again. Who else okay. In your yeah. In, in your packet, in your packet is that information. On on page three of the bid, or uh, page four of, of the memo. Uh, Kim Construction, Suburban General, Northwest General, and in Intra Tech, Infra Truck. Any other questions? Uh, Tony? Sure. Um, when you have the uh, pre construction video recording, is there any way we can take a look at that when, they, when that uh, recording is completed to see the before and after? Um, yeah, come on, Kathy. Kathy Morley from RJN, our consultant on this project. Go ahead, Kathy. Whenever we have um, a potential for open co construction, and in this case, it would be the um, removal and replacement of the manhole covers, we always have contractors do the pre-construction. You know, pre um, that's a standard with, with any um, construction work. Um, we did it on Addison Road with the water main as well. And it's one, it's, it covers the contractor. If a homeowner comes back and says, you know, this wasn't like this, but it also is a protection too for the homeowner if, um, if in fact the contractor has damaged a driveway or something in the meantime. And so, uh, yes, you can certainly have a copy of that. Um, we, we get a copy and then we pass it on to the, um, the village. They usually come on flash drives these days. We used to have them on DVDs, but they just you know, send it on flash drives these days. But yeah, you can certainly have a copy. We keep them and, and often refer to them you know, if there's any incidents once the construction is finished or when we're going through final restoration, that's obviously when the homeowners are most concerned about what's going on in their vicinity. Okay, thank you. Eugene. Could you just recall what area this is again? Um, this is area um, one and area two of the project area, which is um, basically areas south of Montrose um, and west of Wooddale Road. Um, there's the area around on Elizabeth, at Elizabeth um, over to Addison Road, and then it's the, um, the far s southwest corner of, of town over on of, of Gilbert, Mary Jane, um, Ehrman, in that area. South, south of the, uh, excuse me, the area south of the, uh, the power lines. Tony? So, so for instance, if once they make this, do this project, and in the future when we start working on construction, on alleviating some of the flooding, will they have to go back in and and reconstruct what they what they're going to be working on here? Or no, because the the flooding is is for uh, storm sewers, okay. and this is solely sanitary sewers. So this is what we're doing right now is um, is to go through and try to seal up the sanitary sewer system as much as we can to stop the water from having to go to the treatment plant, and then we have to treat clean basically cl clean rainwater. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Roll call, please. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Sosmarski? Yes. yes. Alderman Eugene Lewis. And that passes. Items to be considered at future meetings. Prospect Avenue Speed Hump Survey, uh, June 12th. Anything else anyone would like to add? Go ahead, Peter. Um, I'd like to add uh, last 
I think it was last week, the mayor and I had a homeowner on Knollwood, um, right where we have our lift station, the whole street flooded, and it looks like, in talking to Matt, it looks like Bensonville owns the property where that pond is or what, whatever, retention pond or whatever it is. And it looks like there's kind of a berm all along there except for where our, our uh, lift station is. So I just kind of want to look into is there an easy fix for this or is this you know, going to be a big project or? So what is it that you want on the agenda or? Um, to talk about it and see is this, a, is this a big project to do? Is this something we could do in house? Is Matt, this something we'd have to hire somebody for? You good on that or? Yeah, I mean, it's probably a project we can do in house. Um, I can put some stuff together and we can bring it back to you guys if you want us to. That's fine. Okay, uh, Eugene. Matt? Um, well, I guess the answer, the easy answer to that question is yes. Um, the, um, I wasn't here for that portion of that project. Um, what is happening is there's a, there's a uh, area that is owned by the Bensonville Park District back behind Knollwood Drive, um, and the water is coming out of there and going um, onto the street and flooding the street but not um, invading any homes, staying in the curb line. Um, what we think we can do is to build a barrier, um, a berm to stop the flow of water onto um, City of Wooddale property, um, but um, it's a kind of a regional f flooding issue that uh, it probably needs to be some sort of joint um, venture between uh, uh, the city and the Bensonville Park District. Go ahead, Eugene. Well, we just spent, uh, I don't know the dollar amount it was, we just spent all that money out there, and we didn't realize that when we designed, well, designed or did that street that this could happen down the line. So we spent all that money up there for the street, and we still got a street that's going into water when I'm here. Stay in the street. Well, apparently we do, and Matt, you're going to look into that, right? Okay. Uh, right. On that, I would like to know who the engineer was on that. That was Baxter and Woodman. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Mayor? I want, oh, I, go ahead. I want to, and by Sweet Baby Ray's Daly, have we paid that out yet? Have we paid? Paid that out yet? The I, dollars. I believe that was par, part of the partial payment, one of the partial payments in the past. Okay. Are you asking if that was paid in full? Yes. No, it's because not paid in full. Because there's still work that needs to be done there. There's still work that needs to be done in the project, yes. Okay. Okay. You good? Mayor? Yeah, regarding that, um, where that flooding happened on the street, if I remember right, there was also, the, there's a county pond there, and I mean, and the street, what happened was that pond over overflowed when uh, we got that inch and a half or two inch of rain in 45 minutes. I stopped over there as a resident that took the picture of the video. I asked him if that was happening before and he goes, well, it kind of started, you know, when we got a lot of rain because he said somebody did some work three years ago or something and put in a new fence. Now you can see this piece of new fence. He said they cleaned it up or they removed the berm. I'm not 100% sure how it was, but that was what the gentleman said. That, and since then, so I don't know if there was a lot of dead trees in the way before, and that was the berm or what. That's, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. think you say a simple fix, but if you put a berm there, all of a sudden, are you going to divert that water over to somebody's house? And we're going to, I mean, I, I would think you're going to have to engineer something. Yeah, probably. Yeah, we'll look into it and keep, we'll keep the project on the front burner. Good. The only other reason I brought it up is we do have a generator there, which if that goes underwater, it's probably going to cost the city sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 to replace. So that's all the reason I brought this up tonight. Thank you.
Okay, but Matt, you have kind of direction to go with on this. Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. I just want to say we got flooding all over the city, so we, we have to reevaluate the whole city, not just one portion. I okay. mean, uh, last Monday we all know what happened uh, in Prospect and uh, in Potter, so that's what I have to say on that. Right. Okay, uh, I'd like to, uh, if there's no more to be added, um, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Call the Finance and Administration Committee to order. With a minute taker, take note the same people are here from the prior committee. Need approval of minutes from May 8th, 2014. Make that motion. Second. Any opposed? Motion carries. You have a report recommendation? Or all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have a report recommendation for our organizational staffing study. Brad? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this item, as mentioned in the memo, uh, was brought up during the CIP planning process, uh, probably December, November, December time. I was put in the CIP, there was a little discussion at that time, and originally uh, we were looking to do this study probably September, October time uh, due to some of the uncertainties going on with the Elgin O'Hare, specifically the frontage road system and some of the timing of it. Uh, during the budget process, uh, you all may recall there was an extensive discussion on personnel at that time and some of the Elgin O'Hare items had come into clearer focus, so at that time staff was directed to move this project up from September, October time to the front end of the fiscal year. Uh, with that in mind, staff began preparing the RFP, uh, sent it out. Uh, we did reach out to five firms, and I will apologize in advance to Alderman Eugene Wesley. Since they did not even respond, we did not list them. Um, if you want to know who they are, I can tell you. Um, and so we did get the two uh, responsive bidders back. Uh, Gov HR USA used to be Voorhees and Associates, and before that they were the PAR group. It's the exact same company, same address, same players. They just constantly rebranded themselves uh, over time. And then uh, Sikich, uh, who was out of Aurora, uh, were the two respondents. Uh, based upon their effectively exactly the same proposals, uh, even down to some of the headings were uh, verbatim to one another, uh, staff is at this time uh, recommending, if the council so chooses to move forward, to go with the GovHR USA proposal. Not to exceed $27,000. Budget amount, budget amount was 30,000. There a motion to a second? I'll second it. Ms. Winger. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not looking to uh, to be affirmative on, on this. Um, I believe that it's too soon to do this analysis. We got to have um, the Elgin O'Hare take more shape. And um, it, I believe that there's too many unknowns right now. And, and then once we receive the data, it's not going to be usable, usable once we're looking to put it into practice. Thank you. Jacob. Um, Brad, typically when companies keep changing their names, that means there might be a problem. Do we like look into this company, make sure they have good references, et cetera? Uh, yeah, we're not uh, aware of any, any names. Uh, the first name change was uh, just pretty much a, a straight up buyout. The next name, uh, they've recently started up a, a temping agency that's Gov Temps USA. So in uh, the name of trying to brand themselves equally, um, they, they've just kind of converted that to try and rebrand themselves. Um, you know, we, we've talked to a number of places that have done studies with them recently. Like I said, it's the same, same players that's trying to brand themselves a little more, uh, I don't know if you want to say positively, whatever it is, uh, get away from the personal names and to just to more of a brand. Yeah, there's no issues uh, that, we're, that we're readily aware of. Thank you. Attorney Bob. Yeah, I, I would concur. We do use uh, use that, and we have over the various name changes. As uh, as the finance director indicated, it was a there was an ownership, same group of people, just an ownership shift. But they've been 
expanding the scope of it, uh, of what exactly what they do, and that's what the GovTemp uh, label is. But it's, a, it's been consistently since that initial change, the same management structure that they've got there. I will be the one that uh, I, I brought this up. You know, the, and the reason why this was brought up is because the simple reason is I guarantee you we're going to have a year here or two. We got a lot of people that may be exiting, retiring early or calling it quits. And maybe our staff will come and say, well, we need to replace that position. Well, maybe we don't. If we know Elgin O'Hare is 2000, the mayor's 2016, if I am mistaken, completion? 2017. 2017 on the yeah. east west, but they're already starting, uh, I think, this coming month over at Lively and uh, sometime in September over at Middle. Right. So the reason why I brought this up now is because I understand your concern, but we need to start playing ahead of the ballgame here. I mean, now. <coughs> I don't want to come in and catch 22 here that staff comes in and says, oh my God, five guys just retired. We need to move quick and hire these positions. Some of our department may be overstaffed. Some of them may be understaffed now. It's not, I mean, I'm not trying to push this through, but I understand the concerns, but we have talked about this not once, not twice, but three times since I've been on this council. <coughs> this study. I, I just don't see what, why we can't move forward with this. It's a working tool for us. I mean, why do we waste our time going out for comparables of raises that is so far out too? That time we get that report, it's already two years old. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I say award a contract to them. I will be asking that I get a copy of both proposals for I can look at them and I don't care. I would be asking for it, make sure they're comparable. So, I think it's a smart move. I think we should move forward. So here. Uh, Mr. Mermis, in, in years past, um, DMMC used to put out numbers of staffing levels per capita um, in, in each of the DuPage um, towns. Had, have we seen that lately on what our staffing levels are on the per capita ratio compared to other municipalities uh, well the one thing to, to keep in mind is this is not just like a, a ratio on per capita this is going to analyze exactly what the employees are doing and maybe it's not how many employees you have but how efficient the department could be working any potential for restructuring so I'd be hesitant to just lump it in with just pure numbers mm -hmm. there's a lot of analysis through interviews and things like that and uh, I haven't seen a per capita number in a while. I don't know, Brad, if you've seen anything. We haven't seen anything in a while. I, I would believe it's worth it to, to, to look at that first and just see if we're way off or not or if we're pretty lean before going forward. Thank you. I would be with Alderman uh, Wesley um, to do this uh, just because of the fact when we were doing the budget we had a big discussion with all the aldermen up here whether we should have a couple part-timers or a full-timer, and I think this would help figure all that out. And usually these companies help save the community money by finding uh, ways that, uh, changing the processes or, way, or ways we're doing things. Thank you. Mr. Woods? Yeah, I was gonna <coughs> say, I mean, these, these are developed to, to project no different than our strategic plan. We look down the road five years, so we know that the expressway or the tollway is coming. We know when it's coming. We know all the other things, so we can make those projections, and this will help us as a guiding document. Do we need to, are we potentially looking to hire three police officers, two in cars, one on a bike? Or, you know, do we need the assistant city manager, or do we need two other different people, or do we need four part-time people? So. I'd be in favor of at least analyzing it and seeing uh, where we're at. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Do we have a motion? Yes. yes. A second. Okay. We have a roll call. Yeah. Alderman Lazara. Yes. Alderman Jacob. Yes. Alderman Winger. No. Alderman Catalano. 
Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Motion passes. Items to consider on future meetings, uh, amusement tax, June 12th, and TIF on June 26th. Anything else? No. On the, the, the TIF, is that the Thorndale? Anything else be added? Make a motion for adjournment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?